<laughs> it's starting to get chilly outside. If you've ever wished you could have a little jacket for your dick, you're in luck. Sheath underwear has two pouches, one for your dick, one for your balls. It keeps things separated so you can get on with your life without having everything mashed together down there. I mean, I wear them all the time. I wouldn't be shocked if I'm wearing them right now. Let's see. Oh, yeah, same. Yep, look. Not oh, planned. Oh, colored. Wearing them. Colorful. I don't think you could say that. There Sorry. we go. We Riff fixed raff. it. It's, uh, it's really the best. I wear them all the time. I love it. Uh, my, they really are my favorite underwear. So Same. Go to, have. go to sheathunderwear.com and use code DRUNK to get 20% off your first order. Plus, sheath underwear's 100% money back guarantee. That's sheathunderwear.com. Promo code DRUNK. Get sheath underwear. Support the show. Support your balls. This guy's the best. He's a military uh, guy, too. Yeah, He's a Robert veteran. Patton. He's a big comedy fan. Huge comedy nerd. And, uh, Great guy. I, every underwear I have is like ripped up in the yeah. pieces. Swiss cheese. This shit stays good. So. Oh, yeah. And they make it for guys and gals. The ladies got it. So, uh, yeah, get some sheath. Best undies in the biz. Are we rolling? Ordered he pulled an OJ? He wrote a book? Damn. Yeah. But OJ got away with it and then wrote the book. That's true. It's funny you see like OJ. He, he went through the trial and wrote the book. Right. This guy didn't go through a trial, did he? No, he was squeaky. He was off. He was good to go. Yeah, I saw Suge Knight was like, I'm not going to testify. And we're like, yeah, well, your word's worth a lot at this point. <laughs> you know? You see when OJ puts on Instagram, every comment is just knife, 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 knife. <laughs> He's on camera on show as like a sports correspondent. Really? It's wow. kind of hilarious. It's hilarious to have just a show where you have a sports show where you're like, yeah, we'll just make OJ the sports correspondent. Yeah. That is amazing. Damn, yeah, that's Cameron's crazy. legitimately funny. That's what I keep hearing. Is he on Barstool? No, he's got a, his own sports show. But, dude, he there's a clip of him on, like, a news show. We got to pull it up. He literally, dude, he gets shot. And he's like, he's like, yeah, people came for me, but they didn't get me. Like, he was talking tough after. Like, he was out of the hospital, like, a day. And he's talking <laughs> shit. Wow. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. If I got shot, I would. That'd be my whole personality. <laughs> I'd just be like, ah, oh, shit, I don't want to go outside again. I got shot. This is my whole thing. I wouldn't be bragging about well, it. Well, I'd be like, please don't do that again. Yes, that please. Hurts. I love you. Whatever you want, I'll, <laughs> I'll give you money. But the Tupac thing is crazy because I heard he got caught from TikToking. He was oh, making TikTok that's videos. Got yeah, he, he was say? he was bragging about it on TikTok. Which, too bad JFK never had a TikTok guy. That would be great if that existed back then. That would have been a shorter Oliver Stone film. <laughs> True. What do we got? Is this it? I don't know. Uh, you paused on a... One last question. What, uh, no, this isn't it. What exactly did the, uh, the, the, the guy say? Was to like they said, it's not it, but you're going to let it roll out. <laughs> great great uh, Google guy we Google got. Google bitch. Uh, you're not touching that coffee? Take it. I'm taking it. All right. So you were in Europe for Woo! a month. Ooh, yeah. I missed you, man. I've been talking a big game. Hey, I'm a tough guy. I'm cool. And I was like, I don't get jet lagged. It hits you two days later. Oh, man. What do you mean? What are you, Superman? You get jet lagged. I never got it, really. I, I got to Europe. I, I, I adjusted quick. I land back here. I'm wrecked. My head feels like it's this big. I'm cloudy. I'm gay. I'm all over the place. Damn. But. Europe was a blast. I'm cultured now. Can you explain the pictures of all you guys dressed like sure. in a gay bathhouse? A lot to in talk the 70s about. In with uh, David Bowie? Yeah, well, we went to the Kit Kat Club. Pull okay. that up. I'm sure there's not a lot of photos of it because they don't allow phones. But, it, no, Berlin. Everyone said, uh, if you're going to Berlin, you got to go to a sex club. And I said, you're damn right. Who are you talking to? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I get that too in like Montreal. You got to go to a strip club. Like, I think I hang out with fucking scumbags. <laughs> well, I was with Ghislaine. But um, <laughs> so, yeah. So I was like, all right, we got to do it. But if you go, you got to dress up. You can't just show up in a fucking cardigan and yeah. an Argyle sweater. So uh, the lady was all over it. The wife was like, we're going to this store like the sex club store. We're going to get the boots. We're getting the shorts. Oh we're getting God. the garter belt. We're getting the neck collar. That's a manscaped uh, boxer brief, by the way. <laughs> I had no shorts. And we spent a fortune on this shit. Uh, but uh, you, you've already lost it. Man, but, yeah. what, what are you doing? Oh, wait, okay. So, pictures there. Oh, so we got, uh, yeah, were those uncomfortable? This does not look comfortable. Uh, 
yeah, you, you got to get used to it. I mean, I'm wearing fishnets, too, if you notice they're pink. And uh, I had a decent bulge. I took a blue chew. And, yeah, I got eyeliner going. It was fun. You guys look like a, like a sexy band in the 80s or something. Yeah, yeah, Duran Duran or something. Yeah. So uh, we show up. The thing opens at 10. We got there at like 9.15 because we're like, we should get some food first. I didn't know you're supposed to wear like a trench coat. You get in and then there's lockers. So everyone yeah, gets Yeah, why would all, you know that? That's insane. Yeah, so we're walking around the street like this an hour before eating shawarma. So I'm at a shawarma place, like, I'll have the lamb, please. And the guy's like, what the fuck? And I'm just eating it. I think they just thought we were weird Americans. Um, <laughs> so we get in there, and it is insane. There's a room. There's so many different rooms. There's a techno room, a tango room. There's a full swimming pool. Tango. Tango. That feels like too classy a dance for this outfit. Well, people start tangoing and it gets them cooking, and then they yeah. start uh, fucking. So we is, I there, saw is there sex in there? Full on sex, blowjobs everywhere. What? There's a bunch of bars in there. There's a bunch of uh, couches, and nothing is sanitized. Everything would get me tooed in like eight minutes here. No, because you're volunteering it. I guess so. The Me Too is the work environment thing, not the. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't. This isn't where Weinstein was doing his deeds. I don't know. It felt like it. There was a casting couch. It was wild. <laughs> but there's an old guy jerking off. There was what? A guy, yeah. How a, old? I'm talking eighty, like a Biden, just walking around. Woo, nice. baby. Maybe it was him. There was a naked guy in a wheelchair. He was, uh, you know, handicapped, just going around, full dong out. It was crazy. In a wheelchair? In a wheelchair. It's a, it's a beautiful story. They were uh, dwarves with, with, with uh, collars and, and, a, and a leash. Are people wearing masks? Are they protecting their identity? No, no, Eyes no. Wide shut? All out there. I, that's, that's where I got COVID. No mask. You got no, COVID then? No, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, it was insane. And then eventually, after being there, because it just flies by, because there's so much stimulus, so much to look at. And I go, hey, wife, we got to go bang. And she's like, what, really? I'm like, there? Yeah, I'm like, well, when in Rome, everyone's doing it, so we fucked. W like in public? In public. And the fact that I got hard is a goddamn miracle. That's fucking weird, I was looking weird, at all Mark. the other men. It's like, I mean, I want to yes and you here, but you're... <laughs> You're fucking in public now? What, the, what kind of person have you become? You, you, you blend in. You know, you go to Berlin. You, you, you know, you go with the people. Mark's next slide is, we went to a Nazi rally. I didn't want to salute, but you got to blend in. I was following orders. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm banging the lady. Now, here's where it gets wow. real wacky. It wasn't easy. I mean, it took a lot of, a lot of like, you good? Yeah, okay. what, is there like a way to get hard in an environment like this? Mostly looking at the other women. <laughs> that helped because there's naked women everywhere. If you looked at the guy in the wheelchair, he's like, that'll do it. <laughs> oh, Lieutenant Dan over there. <laughs> so um, I'm plowing the lady, uh. and this I got her from behind. This is open dance floor like that. Oh, my God. And uh, this guy comes up and taps me on the shoulder, and I go, uh-oh. Might, we might be in trouble. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. And I look back. And he goes, me next? And I go, what the fuck? Get out of here. They don't, but, they don't have me too in Amsterdam. They have me next. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag me next. And But that's normal there. He, he wasn't even being a dick. He was just like, oh, all right, you, you met some lady who wants to get railed. I'll do her next. Jeez. That, so that was uh, kosher. It's, I don't mean to, to sound, you know, prude here, but it's so unromantic. You know, oh, like, yeah. like uh, part of the fun is the chase and the, and the seduction and uh, dude just being like, you line up like it's the bathroom, right? It's a little weird, isn't it? Yeah, he took a number, uh, but <laughs> like a deli. Yeah, exactly. I'm number two. <laughs> Started ramming her. Woo! He wanted that beef tongue. You asked for a sample. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, that's incredible. You did that. How many people were watching? Uh, well, it's so normal that like people walk by and go, "Oh, how about that?" And they just move on. Are you worried about getting recognized? A little, but the outfit helped. I had a couple people say, hey, comedy, which was weird. I oh said, comedy. And They're then, yelling uh, your catchphrase, yeah. Walt. <laughs> yeah. Walt, <laughs> Mark's I, fucking his wife. I gave a praise Allah out of the <laughs> gate. And so I'm, I go, ah, get out of here. I wave him off. And now I'm starting to get like, all right, I'm fucking this woman in public. Uh, I got a guy tap me on the shoulder. There's people everywhere. People are staring at us. There's the gimp in the, the wheelchair with the mask and a dick clamp. And I'm kind of starting to lose it. Like, all right, I gotta free. I'm freaking out. I gotta stop this. Did you come? No, I was about to. There's a guy next to me. I look to my left. Old guy jerking off, staring at me with his tongue out. And I said, "That's it. Wrapped it up. 
Couldn't do it. The wife's like, what are you doing? I was going, I was getting into it. I was like, ah, that. And she was like, oh, and I, we walked away. I hate to say it, but under, under the circumstances, he was in the right. No, I'm not mad at you. You're the guy. fucking in public at a sex club. He should get the jerk off to it. If he was a little better looking, I would have gone with it. But really? he was an ugly guy and he was kind of scary. It was looking. Joe Biden. If it was Hunter, you would have done it. Yes, exactly. It could have been Hunter. <laughs> That's true. Hunter Gatherer. Was thing. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I had to bail and she was kind of like, oh, that was a little anticlimactic. And I was like, I know, but that the jerk guy, I was out. <laughs> the jerk guy. I can only go so far. We're still, you know, comedians who live in New York. I mean, I don't think I could ever do... Could you ever do something like that? No, but I love how... Matt peeves, Peters, could you? Yeah. How the peeves have gone from, the streets of New York are too crowded, to, I don't like this guy jerking off on my wife. Yeah. Subway, I'll take it. Think, things have gone too far. Yes. <laughs> oh, you have? have? You? How was that? It was really weird. A lot of old people. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I was listening to a, a guy fuck my wife in the other room. A guy had sex Wait, with your what? wife? My ex-wife. Oh, oh, whoa. Is that what ended it? <laughs> a 60-year-old lady asked me if I wanted a blowjob. I said... A 60-year-old lady? Well, she was old. Oh. Dude, wow. you know... Uh, yeah, I guess you don't ask your age. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's... Uh, God damn, Matt. You're like a whole other life. I, I guess that's no who idea. should be at the sex club is old people. If you're young and you're starting at that place, that's fucking weird. Well, that's the thing about this club is they're very uh, picky. So everyone in there was uh, it was either hot people with great bodies or anomalies. You know, the wheelchair guy, the the dwarf, uh, the you know the guy with the gimp mask and covered in tattoos. Like everyone had a thing, mm. or you were hot. So the only reason we got in is because we our promoter got us on the list. Thank God. <laughs> what a weird request. Yeah. I love that you did that. That's insane. Oh, you pulled up the, oh, the Boogie Nights. <laughs> Damn, what that, a sad scene. Ooh, that was Peter's after the wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tragic character. Yeah. Brutal. There's a lot of sad characters in Boogie Nights, but that one takes a cake. Yeah, sad. It's a, not a good sign when you're more sad than Seymour Hoffman in a movie. <laughs> That's hard to pull off. <laughs> when you're the more depressing yeah. character. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Mark, I cannot believe you did this. Well, you know, I was out there so long, out in Europe, you kind of detach. And you're yeah. just like, who am I anymore? And you kind of just start going into these weird Yeah, places. but how are you going to go back to just fucking your wife on your bed at home after doing something like this? Well, I hired a guy. <laughs> he comes out, he stands by the bed, and we're good to go. Yeah, no, but it, it's actually nice to be back, because now I can like be myself and throw her legs around. In there, I was like head on a swivel. I was like a Cub Scout, you know? So you were there with a friend. Did he get to see any of this? Uh, no, I wanted to get away from Doug. Doug Key, everybody. But he yeah. uh, he had his own fun. He, was, he met some girls? He met some girls, and he's a good-looking guy. He's ripped, yeah. and the guys in there weren't great. The women were gorgeous, but the guys weren't great, so he really stood out, and he got hit on quite a bit. Yeah, he's a good-looking dude. Good-looking guy, 12-pack, huge arms, and uh, yeah, they loved him. <laughs> Is there a language barrier when you're trying to hook up with someone there? It's like no, club, the only thing was the bouncer was a bit of a dick because he's, you know, he's so important. This big, Nazi, bald, buff guy was like... How come we got to learn English? You can't learn German? And we were like, uh, we don't live here. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're damn right you don't live here. And I get in there. And I think that's just part of it. Like, they're mean It's kind of fun when they are. Yeah. You ever go to, like, a burger place, like uh, Paul's Burger Joint, and the and the waitress is just kind of rude to you, and you're yes. like, I kind of like it. Yes. That's where it starts, the, the minor abuse. Then you end up in a sex club. But Yeah. yeah. And I will say there was something fun about the no phones. Like, you're like, I got to take a photo of that. I got to take it. And then after 20 minutes, you're like, fuck it. Let's live. Yeah. I like that there's no phones. <laughs> yeah, I don't want this on video, this well, jerk the, the phone you break out because you're bored. You're not bored at a sex club, you know? Good point. You break your phone out when, you know, your girlfriend's telling you a story, not when you're good point. fucking your girlfriend. Also makes yeah. you feel pretty good about the dong size. I'm no prize here. But, but there's yeah, some losers. Lose. I mean, some, some real acorns in a bush. <laughs> Acorns in a bush is the worst it's way just to that, describe that little turtle head popping. You know what Oof. I'm talking about. Yeah, like, uh, oh, God. And a guy, you know what's weird? The guy jerking off. That guy, gets, he, he, he's got a whole backstory. Yeah. Like, yeah. that person has a life. I know. He like, you know, maybe he's like a widow or something, and he's just like, yeah, I'm going to, I'll be a jerk off at the club guy now. I had the same thought. You go to Subway Sandwiches, and that guy's in there. Yeah. He's eating, or, or a lady, a hot lady's just like at the airport. But they don't know about the secrets. Yeah, he's deep throating the sub, but he's still yeah. eating that. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a 12 incher. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there was some impressive dongs too, but uh, sure. I felt pretty good. 
Yeah. At the end of the day, that's yeah. Good. I mean, you're fucking, you feel good enough to whip it out and fuck your wife in there. That's true. This episode's going to be demonetized in a second. Oh, We right. literally open with Mark's like, I fucked my wife in a oh, club. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I mean, whatever. It yeah, happens. Yeah, it's a true story, and it was at a sex club. You know, I did it in the right place. It was That's appropriate. I, I can't believe it. I, I don't think I, I don't think I could perform in public. If this was in the Bronx, I couldn't have done it. But the fact that you're so far away, you yeah. know. I think there's another reason you couldn't have done it in the Bronx, well, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of acorns there. <laughs> yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> but, uh, no, I know what you mean. The, the the removal, you're gone so long, it's almost like, who cares, right? Exactly. There's a weird thing. When you're on the road long enough, there's a party that takes over. Like, who gives a shit? Give me, give me other highlights of Europe. Okay, so uh, we got three days off, which was a gift, because you're living out of that suitcase. You're on a flight every day, a train every day. It's 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 one country to the next, to the next, and it's a lot on you. So we had three days off. The wife left because she was like, I got to go back to work. I have to go back to civilization. Me and Doug go, fuck it. We got three days off. What should we do? Fuck it. We got drunk. We bought tickets to Paris. We wow. flew to Paris, which was a horrific flight. We had to connect in Reykjavik, Reykjavik, whatever. My favorite tennis player. Yeah, no vex. And <laughs> uh, we had to fl- uh, get it. It was like an eight-hour travel day. We wanted to kill ourselves. This is why. At Doug- least you're with someone, though. Yes, and this is why I love Doug. This motherfucker bought those boots. He bought like you know, eight-inch platform whatever boots to wear to the club. He's like. I got the receipt. I'm going to return these boots when I get back to America to pay less because they were $60. He carried those boots all over Europe. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. So we go to Paris. He's got the boots with him. Uh, but we go to Paris, and you want to kill yourself. The, the fucking flight is hell, connecting, language barrier. You're tired. You're hungover. You're packing. You got the boots. Right when you land in Paris, you get in an Uber. You pass by that Eiffel Tower. You go, this is the best decision we ever made. We got a little Airbnb. Doug's such a nut, he set up four shows. We set up four shows at a, at a little club, we sell them all out, and we had a great time. Oh, uh, Paris. It's so cool that you're at a point in your career where you can go to Paris and say, I want to sell out a show in yes! Paris, and people come out. That's how I felt like, it's not the same, but like, I had a canceled flight in Montreal and I was stuck for the night, pop-up show that night sells out, and you're like, it's amazing we're at a point in our lives where, you know, we can just do that. It's, I'm grateful Totally agree. Fuck. That's that, so, so give me some Paris highlights. I mean, Paris, it's a reason why it's cliche, like the prettiest city, because it really is. I mean, there's a lady singing opera on the bridge, and the sun was setting. I'm holding a, a Prosecco at a restaurant, just looking at everything. The boats go by, the Eiffel Tower, Doug Key. We went to um, Sacre Coeur, Sacred Heart Church. He cried, he wept. <laughs> it was so pretty. It was like, I was supposed to come here with my grandmother, and she died. And I'm like holding Doug. We look like two weirdos. I'm eating a baguette. He is a baguette. I feel like you're doing the, the weird part of the relationship with him. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're fucking your girlfriend in the sex club. Then you're like, there, there. To him in Paris. Like, what the hell? <laughs> That's true. That's true. What the hell happened here? Then I fucked I'm Doug. <laughs> <laughs> you fucked him in the church. Yeah. Now, that same that old guy was loose. jerking off in the church. Oh, uh, yeah. Notre Dame. So uh, we had a great time. Did the shows. The shows were great. And uh, then we flew back and just did Dublin. Dublin was the hottest crowd. That Vicker Street is an amazing venue if you ever get a chance to do In it. In Dublin. Yeah, it's up there with next like the year. Wilbur or the Moor. It's Man. just magical. I'm filming my next special at the Wilbur oh, in March. The tickets nice. on sale later this month. But yeah, I'm I'm pumped, man. I feel good about the hour. It's it's cooking. So my friend saw you in Chicago. Was like, holy shit! I was blown away. Uh, I feel all right. I, that was a hot night because we had Mateo Lane plays the Chicago Theater. Chicago kid, big deal, right? You know. And then uh, we we're on the same flights. His husband, him, me, and we uh, literally. I go up to him at the urinal. I just see a mohawk, and I realize. I take a chance because I was just like, hey, you pussy. And then I was like, oh, shit, this might not be Mateo. But then he turned uh, around, I was like, thank God. Uh, I just chanced it on the Mohawk. Wait, yeah. he has a Mohawk? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that kind like of sex club story. Is yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then I started fucking him in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, I jerked off. <laughs> so we're sitting on the, you know, we're on the flight. We're going there and he goes, hey, I'm making pizza at, at Lou Monati's later tonight in the kitchen for my YouTube channel. You want to do it with me? I was like, of course. So. 
I, you know, I do, we make pizza. It's so fucking fun. But you know, that deep dish pizza is no joke. Oh yeah. So, you know, I had three slices, I'm dying. I feel sick. And then my girlfriend sees me post about it. She's like, oh, I want a Chicago pizza. So I was like, fuck it, ordering it again. I had it for dinner as well. Oh. I wanted to oh, kill myself. I worked out dude. twice the next day. We go to a yoga class. I did, I swam like 60 laps in the hotel. We were in a hotel with a sick pool. Uh, but we do uh, yoga the next day. I just was like, I need something to do. She set it up. So we go. It's called uh, Funky Friday. It was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. Oh, no. It was a hot class. We're in the dark. We were the only people that, like, I guess there was, like, they're all regulars. Yeah. So they had, like, inside jokes that we didn't get. They're just like, are you guys ready for Funky Friday? And I'm just Woo! like, I don't, everyone's laughing. I'm like, I don't get how this is funny. Is you this, know? like, fun mom stuff? Is that what this is? I guess. But <laughs> they keep making jokes like that. And they're like, it's funky because the room is set up different. And I'm like, okay, I have no basis for comparison because I've never been here. I don't get the joke. Anything funky is never fun. It's never fun. You and know? she kept saying it. Oh, that's and weird. It's like those places where you drink and paint. Whoa, <laughs> everybody watch out. We're drinking wine and painting. Woo, crazy. So lame. It's like drinking on a podcast just to make it stand out. It's like I pathetic. Know. Losers. You know? um, but yeah, Chicago Theater, he does it Friday. I do it Saturday. So we do guest sets on each other's shows. And I was wow. like, what a fucking crazy weekend that we just can do that. That's incredible. And, uh, yeah, both, both sold out. It was like, you know. His crowd was amazing. My crowd was amazing. Uh, he got a nice little Chicago pop when he came out from my audience, which oh, is nice. Oh, great. Hometown kid. And uh, yeah, his whole family's there. It was, it was pretty cool. Oh, and uh, yeah, it was a hell of a night, man. Chicago is just the best. It's the best. That's why I did the special there. Me too. There's something about it. Yeah, exactly. I love so, it. Yeah. I even mentioned James Webb on stage. He's a Chicago kid. And everyone applauded for oh, him. Oh, Because wow. he's filming. Yeah, because he's... so cool. I bet he brought... I think he brought a lot of friends, you know? Oh, oh that's and that's so, a great theater. That theater is special. That marquee, you can't beat it. Dude, I was doing crowd work in a close to 4,000 seater. Wow. Because it's that intimate for a 4,000 seater. You know, it's 3,600 or something. Sure. So, you know, I only did it for like, you know, seven minutes or so, you know, toward the end, just to, uh, just to fuck around a little bit. But... Uh, you can do it in a theater. That's how crazy it is. Yeah, beautiful play. I think Mulaney did a special there as well. Yeah, I feel like he picks really classy theaters always. Cause didn't he do one at? Uh, he did one at Radio, Radio City. City. I yeah. think he did one at Town Hall too. Oh uh, man, he always picks like really classy, mm -hmm. beautiful theaters. Yeah, wow, that is so cool though. Uh, I love Chicago. I can't believe Mateo got hair plugs. And then does a mohawk. Isn't that a weird move? <laughs> Getting cocky. Yeah. Who do you think you are? Well, we uh, our guest today, Nick Offerman's a, a Illinois guy, so he messaged me. He's like the Chicago Theater, you know. So wow. I'm excited he's coming on today, man. He's a great guy. So where did you meet him? I met him in Calgary. So uh, I actually met him years ago at a benefit in Austin. He was hosting, um, and it was like me, him, uh, a bunch of a bunch of big comedians were on it. I was like the smallest comic on it, but he hosted and he was really cool. And then uh, we did this gig, the Great Outdoors Fest in Calgary with me, him, and Dan Soder. Fucking amazing hang, hot show, so fun. So does he do? Does he have jokes? Like, does he do an act? He does That's... a lot of musical stuff, some mm. stories. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's super funny. Uh, All right. Obviously, you've seen him, you know, and he's an incredible comedic and dramatic actor. I can't wait to meet him. I've, I've told the story before, but the only time I met him was at Conan, and he was in a robe. And he jerked off. No, he uh, <laughs> he was in a. Oh, I was in a robe, and I was getting a haircut. And he said, "Shave the boy and bring him to my room." Oh, and that, was, that was the only exchange we had. I, wow. We all laughed. It killed in the room, and that was it. Yeah, I saw him on TV this morning. He was on Morning Joe promoting his new book. So uh, pumped to have him here. Is it just a? I should know this. Is it a biography? Is it? No, a, it's a it's a travel book. Oh, great. Uh, so yeah, why don't we pull that graphic up so we're prepared? Yes, and, uh, yes. Sally Hughes pulls up Mind Kampf. You know, <laughs> gotta get it together, Sally. So why don't, be ready. We, why don't we? Uh, yeah. There we go. Why don't we? We want to just chill till he gets here. We got seven minutes. I'm, I got to pee anyway. All right, you got to pee. Should we get ice for the scotch too? Ooh. Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. Just want to let you know that I'm performing at the Madison Square Garden Theater November 4th. I can't wait. Tickets on my website. You got it? Okay. What do I do about the burning sensation? What do I do? Hey, hey folks, We Might Be Drunk is brought to you by Ship Station. It's the calm before the holiday storm. Before things get too nutty, make sure you're prepared with Ship Station. ShipStation lets you simplify and automate your shipping. No matter how big your business grows, automate your shipping and even returns in their easy-to-navigate dashboard. With a free trial 
and quick setup it's easy to find out if ship station is right for the next step in your business Woo! we love ship station you got to get on it because uh, things are about to get even crazier it's fun giving gifts it's fun sending stuff so get the hell in there <laughs> easily manage orders print labels compare rates and automate delivery notifications you'll even get discounts of up to 84 percent off ups and up usps rates whether you sell on amazon etsy ebay or shopify ship station will work for you Join the 130, 130,000 companies who've grown their business with ShipStation. 98% of companies who use ShipStation for a year become lifelong customers. We should use this for merch. Set your business up for holiday season success with ShipStation. Go to ShipStation.com and use code DRUNKTODAY, D-U-R-N-K, and sign up for your free 60-day trial. Holy hell. That's ShipStation.com, code DRUNK. Get on it! Two Girls, One Cup had a soundtrack, I guess. <laughs> so uh, you got a new book out, we should say, out of the gate. Oh, yeah. Right here, Nick Offerman, where the deer and antelope play. Thanks for yep. joining us, man. This is a travelogue book. Do it you, is, yeah. Do you do the um, audio book? I do. I love to do audio books uh, even, even more Thank you. than writing the book, I think. Thank you, Matt. Totally. It's like a really long podcast. Cheetos. <clears throat> Is, is this your second book? It's my fifth book. Your fifth book. Okay. Fifth That's book. That's a lot. Jesus. That's crazy. Are you Grisham? <laughs> Jeez. Um, yeah, it's, I, I never expected to be a touring humorist. Yeah. I, I just wanted to get good parts and plays in Chicago. And I had a scenery shop. I built scenery for plays. <clears throat> and then, like, I got cast in a couple movies, and a couple people said... Uh, you should come to LA. You make funny faces, so I did, and um, and here we are. Uh, so uh, I started touring, uh, performing as a humorist, and Rashida Jones came to one of my early shows and said, "I love your your talk with like an agenda. Mm. It sounds like you're reading from your book." And I thought, "Oh, actually, I have some more stories of jackassery." Yeah. So then I cast about to see if I could get a book deal and I now, did. What, what does a humorist entail? Well it's interesting because I've, I've been devouring uh, both of your work I'm, 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 I've been fans of yours before like I met Sam doing a gig together recently but uh, you both had just caught my eye over the years because I, I described you to my wife as like the grandchildren of Carlin. Oh man, Jeez. Where, Jesus wow, Christ! Come on. And and what I mean by that is Dan, you're Carlin. not super. You're not very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I mean by that is you can tell you spend a, a lot of blood and sweat and tears like fucking with language and fucking with the line of like what's what's funny what can i get away with there's intelligence because in watching and listening to episodes of this podcast uh people kept talking about david tell and i've always heard his name mm. and i texted sam and said i literally have never i've only heard his name for years and years i've n have never seen him uh and so he, he told me to check out his album Skanks for the memories. Yes, and I and I listened to it in, in a hotel room the other day, and it was. I mean, it's it's so uh, he's so aggressive. His energy is so aggressive mm -hmm. that you like you, you either turn it off or you turn it up. And I turned yeah. I turned it up. I love <laughs> it. Where it's just like he's not going to fucking let give you let you catch your catch your breath. Right. And he got me laughing. And of course, there's stuff. It's 20 years old, so there's stuff right. that's like, oh yeah, I can't do that one anymore. <laughs> but uh, but in the same in the same vernacular, you can tell that you're not just like you know telling dick jokes. You're playing with the form in a way uh, that that uh, when I decided to start doing this, I was aware that I don't have the kind of brain that writes jokes. Mm. I knew uh, I think Zach Galifianakis is one of the comedians I've known the longest, and it was just always aware of how he can sit there and just take any banal situation and think of the funniest goddamn way to describe it or just yes. the stupidest non sequitur that you're like, fuck, man. Like, 
Mitch Hedberg sure. isms that I'm, yeah. I'm like, God damn it! Look what you just did with a bag of Doritos. Or right, whatever the right. Hell. Yeah, Galifianakis has great one-liners that people don't talk about because he's such a big actor with the Hangover and whatnot. Yeah. But killer. Yeah, we watched his. Like, I remember it was like half hour on Comedy Central, being like, "This is fucking great." Oh yeah, I loved his yeah, stuff. Yeah, he's he's somewhere between. Like he's got a little Stephen Wright to him as yeah. well. Oh, yeah, out of left field. But so when I started doing this, I I was like, okay, I don't write jokes. But people laugh at the slow way in which I talk. Hmm. And so I just decided to start calling myself a humorist. And I, I wrote out like a 90-minute show, and I do songs. And I just felt like it allows me... Because when uh, initially Netflix had my first special on Netflix, it was called American Ham. Oh, yeah. They since pulled it off. Uh, but um, But people would complain. People would go through all the comedy... And they'd get to me, and they'd be like, "This isn't fucking, com- this isn't a, a comedian, right?" And I was like, "I, I don't really disagree with you." Like, <laughs> you read the comments? Are you nuts? No, I don't. Uh, I don't remember where I came across that because oh, I, yeah. I, I didn't know you could have comments on like a on that streamer. Um, oh, we did YouTube special, so I, I saw them all, but I'm like, you know. I don't. I don't dwell on them, but I'd be like, "Oh, okay." I yeah. see. I, I, I read the comment. I I read reviews of my books, and people really love my books. Uh, like probably you guys, ninety three percent of people are the, know what, right. know what they're in for, and they love it. And seven percent somehow yeah. <laughs> thought you were a Christian, or like they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're like Nick Offer. If you have ever been to church, Nick Offerman thinks you're an idiot. Oh, and, I, and I'm like, wow. no. In I the, was drunk when I wrote that. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say idiot, no. I, when, uh, whenever I talk about religion at all, I go into all camps mode and literally say, every, each to each their own, like, I, could, I absolutely have no judgment about any, any of this, but if you're going to try and make kids pray in school, like if you're going to yeah. you do shitty things in the name of religion, that's what I want to talk about. Which is the most shitty things have been done yeah. in history. But Also I, extremists. It's please, okay to have yes. an opinion on extremists. That, that's another thing. It it's is. like, if you have an opinion on anything, like Brian Regan has bits that offend people. Yeah, I you know? know, but I just did a Dublin and we did a little Q&A after. One guy was like, talk about the... The Catholics and the Protestants there are just crazy divided. It's like they hate each other. Still. And I I was like, guys, relax. Both of them aren't real. <laughs> that was the punchline. And I posted the clip, you know, fun times, comedian, humorist. And I got a million like, you're going to hell, screw you. And these are all the, the free speech guys. I'm like, I yeah. can't do a religion bit. But. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, tough time. Who, by the way, we have, I haven't been introduced to our friend here. Oh. This is Winnie. Winnie's trying to get more food. <laughs> this is my girlfriend's dog, and she goes to work, and I was like, I, just, I feel bad leaving the dog at home. Yeah, oh. Winnie, Winnie deserves to be here and to weigh in on, She's a good on matters of religion. Oh, yeah, yeah. she hates the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> she only knows one. It's yeah. not her fault. You know, it's, yeah. I have one Jewish friend. And he, and he forgets to let her out sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he can't eat American ham. <laughs> so uh yeah you're uh, you're doing like the press tour now i saw you on msnbc this morning i just flipped it on i was like oh shit there oh, it is fun that w- it was actually nerve-wracking um i am doing uh the it's the paperback publication of of this book this i'm very proud of my book but i also just recently did a psa and this is the least sexy thing that will ever happen on your podcast um, I don't know. He farted on Allison Brie. That was pretty bad. Oh, man. Yeah, I got hard. Well, <laughs> she loves it. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I am invested in uh, agrarian farming. Mm. And so I made this PSA for uh, f- with the NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. It's this lobbying group um, uh, purported like in favor of soil health, like encouraging, we're lobbying Congress <laughs> to encourage farmers to plant cover crops. It's it, it, it's a great climate change fighter. It's a great agriculture thing. And it's something that I will always be invested in. There's a lot of it in my book, although the book is also very entertaining. Uh, All right. There is soil talk, though, <laughs> <laughs> full disclosure. But so the MSNBC appearance was not funny. 
Uh, the PSA is funny. You got a line or two in there. I played dirt. Yeah. Oh, but, fun. But they're asking me, and it's like, you know, pe- people always, uh, you know, people always shit on me, basically. I'm dirt. Um, but we should take care of our dirt. And, you know, you can imagine it needs its health, its microorganisms. And it actually makes it, uh, it's a great carbon sink. If you have healthy dirt, it, it saves water. It does all these things. And so... It's nerve-wracking to go on MSNBC and not be there as an entertainer. Where they're like, so tell us, you know, tell us oh. about fucking farming and Congress. And, and fortunately, there was a really smart lady named Arohi from the NRDC. Mm. And I could, I, I could sort of set her up where I'm like, well, 11% <laughs> of our nation's emissions come from agriculture. <laughs> and, and then she would kick in with a, a paragraph of intelligence. As, yes, classic humorist. <laughs> That's right. The old Garrison Keeler throw to, yeah. <laughs> throw to riders in the it's sky. It's got to excite the TV people, and they're like, oh, this guy's got some dirt on people. And then you get there, and you're like, no, literally, soil. This is it. Can you grab a napkin, too, Matt? Yeah. Well, we got also, could you, I mean, I want to I want to try some of Nick's uh, scotch, too. Nick Offerman has oh, his own definitely. brand of Lagavulin. How the hell did you pull that off? You you have a deal with, I would say, the best scotch. Yeah, it's up there for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Can you imagine? It's I insane. Mean, I, when I was 29, uh, so two years ago, <laughs> when I was 29 in 1999, I was at a film festival in Chicago, and my filmmaker, uh, Scott King, bless his name, uh, he's in Europe now, he said, you know, we introduced the film and we'll, we'll be back in 90 minutes for a Q&A. And he taught me the first lesson of, of film festivals, which is then you go have a drink. It's the perfect amount of time. So we go to a bar and he says, uh, up to that point, I was a broke theater actor. So I would have pints and pints of beer. And then on a special occasion, we'd get Jameson and, and pound some some Irish whiskey. Which is not even the best whiskey. That's funny that you Jameson's that Jameson's great, though. It's solid. I love Jameson. But when yeah. Jameson's your, your number one, it yeah. ain't pappy. Sure, sure. But, I mean, I, I wouldn't have known. Like, it was all about what do you have, what's the best affordable right, whiskey exactly. that, that you have at the Chicago Theater Pub? Is it cool if we drink yours and you have ours? Oh, sure. Because Mark and I have our own rye. It's Bodega Cat Rye. Oh, yeah. We're in the same biz. I did not know that, but I'm, I'm a big rye fan. Hell uh, yeah. yeah. Same. Um, so so he, he bought me my... He, he said, Let me, do you want to try some scotch? I said, sure. I've heard of... Eugene O'Neill wrote about it. Like, yeah. let me check it out. And he got me a glass of Lagavulin. And so he didn't say anything else. So it was like, this is scotch. And then I was ruined. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. But then, how do they? How do you get in cahoots with them? There's a lot of things I like that uh, no one's putting my face on. Cheers, by the way. Oh, hey, guys. and thanks again for coming. Cheers yeah. to lucky sons of bitches. Hell yeah, <laughs> get the book. That is so good. Your rye is quite nice. Ooh, Thank you. as well. Thank you. Top notch. Log of, it's so smoky. It's like it's I like know. drinking bacon or it's something. Like a, it's, right. it's like a, a campfire in your mouth. Yeah. So I was 29. <laughs> so then that became my drink. And then, uh, you know, I learned. And I'm, I'm not picky. Uh, if we have whiskey, we're, we're in good shape. Uh, I'm not persnickety. Sure. But over the years, if, if pit places had Lagavulin, and that's what I would order. And naturally, I learned to then have a rival a rivalry with Lafroig. Oh yeah. Um, and they're actually they're next door neighbors on the coast of the, of Isla. Oh really? Lafroig, Lagavulin, and Ardbeg are right next to each other, and they're all. I like Ardbeg too. Yeah, they're yeah. all nice winter scotch. Very peaty. Totally. Yeah. So when I was then thirty eight, I got the job of Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec. Sure. And somewhere early on, it was in the script, Ron. Leslie comes in for a meeting, Amy Poehler, and Ron pulls out two glasses and a bottle of scotch. So we get to there to the day, and I open my drawer, and it's Lagavulin 16, mm. and I thought, this, these prop people are so good that they found out my favorite scotch. That's amazing. And it was like a year later, I went to Mike Schur, who create, was the main creator of the show, 
I went to his birthday party and I was talking to him and Adam Scott walked up and gave him a bottle of Lagavulin 16 and said, happy birthday. And I said, you know, that's on the show because that's my favorite scotch. And Mike said, no, you fucking idiot. It's my favorite scotch. <laughs> did, did you think they read your mind or something? And so, right. so thanks to Mike, who also had exquisite taste, uh, it became Ron Scotch. And we used it ah. frequently on the show. And eventually we said, has anybody heard from Lagavulin? We literally have given them like a $2 million worth of right. screen time. Yes. <laughs> and we, we, we made a big deal out of it on the show. And finally, towards the end, the answer was no. We hadn't heard from them. That's crazy. They never reached out like, this well, is so cool. They were a pretty small, obscure show. So I think it hadn't mm. quite. And uh, American shows take a couple few years. That's true. To get over and infiltrate the UK right, and, right. I and Ireland. Um, and so uh, towards the end, Chris Pratt got cast in Guardians of the Galaxy. And that was going to shoot in London. And so if we wanted to still have him on the season of Parks, they had to come up with a way to go shoot in London, Whoa. <laughs> our little Indiana show. Yeah. So our brilliant producer named Mor Morgan Sackett, who shoots all the Lagavulin commercials, by the way, um, came up with this way to take the show uh, to, to London. And they sent my character to the Lagavulin distillery. Ah. And so, it was, I mean, it just was it, kismet. It was ridiculous. And so we all hit it off. They liked me and they said, maybe what if we start doing commercials? And I said, oh, yes, that would be fine. <laughs> like, just inching your way in. You want to pay me to say that I like <laughs> oxygen? Sure. <laughs> right. I'll fucking back oxygen. Um, and so I started doing these commercials. Uh, you can find them on YouTube. We have a channel called MyTalesOfWhiskey.com. Mm. Pull it up. There are, I think, 50 of them Jesus. by now. And they're mostly stupid comedy shorts. Uh, is, there, is there like a favorite of yours we could pull up? Um, gosh. Well, the, the, the one that has a gazillion hits was this like uh, this one off idea. Uh, a writer from uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine named David Phillips came up with just pitching, you know, bullshit. And it was to replace the Yule Log. You know how <laughs> there used to be uh, the, the Yule Log channel at sure. Christmas. You put it on the TV and it's just a burning fireplace. So we did our version of that where it's a fireplace and me and a chair next to it. And somebody turned it into a 10-hour loop. <laughs> and, and like every 15 minutes, I take a sip. That's the Yule Log. Wow. And it, it had... It has, you know, it's a... So uh, there's no words? No. That's all, amazing. All I do is sit there. So It so, looks cool as hell, though. That's brilliant. At, at Christmas, then, people, like, in bars or workplaces will put... They'll just put it on yeah. as, like, wallpaper. So that was our biggest hit. I um, love that's it. That's like some sort of Warhol type yeah. art piece at a party. It was, yeah. <laughs> and, and, of course, it was just a prank. On our, it was like a, a throwaway idea. And the, at the time, the longest media we had, we could do a 45-minute take on the card that, the, yeah. that we had. And so the director is, like, crawling. Or it, I mean, how bad do you... You must be farting. You got to pee. I mean, no, how long I mean, do you do this? That's my bag. It was a 45-minute take. Wow. I love it. It's, like, kind of zen. It is. I mean, and then we did we did one for New Year's Eve out in front of the distillery. So, so we start doing these commercials, and uh, <laughs> it's Morgan Sackett and uh, Dean Holland, a great TV director who directed the most episodes of Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. uh, we often go back, uh, been to the distillery six or seven times in the last ten years, and then eventually they decided to make a Lagavulin. Uh, an Offerman version. Finally. Which is, so it's just, it keeps, I mean, I guess they're going to offer me the company. At some yeah, point eventually. It, it <laughs> continues to escalate. Well, the first time we saw it, I was like, oh, like Nick Offerman. And then Matt was like, no, seriously. And I was like, oh, sh I didn't know. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Uh, I'm very grateful. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, apparently, you know, the, the show and my, uh, my endorsement has done them a lot of good. Okay. And so we're very grateful for the relationship. Like every time they pick us up for another year, we, we, we're just like, okay, great. Yes. We're, yeah. We're trying to get Sam one with Pepto. 
All right. Well, we got to get your face on a Pepto because <laughs> he drinks it all the time with the hangovers and the. I mean, I upset mean, stomach on the road. I've switched to peppermint pills, but like you're, oh, you know, you're doing right. a gig on the road. Sure. You chug a Pepto. Yeah, I'm but, trying to get into Plan B. <laughs> I want my face on the pill. <laughs> <laughs> That'll definitely make women want to take it for sure. So, uh, I'm inside of them. <laughs> So that, yeah, this is an amazing gig. So, uh, what kind of input did you have in the making of the Offerman Scotch? The, there's a, a brilliant guy named Stuart Morrison who, uh, and, and now uh, there used to be a, a, an obscure independent distillery. Uh, they have uh, since been purchased by Diageo, which is a big beverage company. So I've through Diageo, I've also done commercials for Talisker and Oban. Um, but, ma- but mainly uh, Lagavulin. Talisker's pretty great. I mean, they're both great. They're fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's insane. The uh, if, it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm-hmm. But this this great uh, alchemist named Stuart Morrison is he he's the guy in the laboratory, and it's pretty fascinating um, because they have think about it like for this is eleven years. So they ha- in or- order to come up with like fifty thousand cases of this. They have to find that much liquid available. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the one that we're doing right now, uh, or this one, for example, uh, we we finished it in these charred oak casks. Mm -hmm. So he he does these experiments where we do tastings, and they're very generous. Like, they let me, he sends me a kit, and and we we do mix. He's like, try a drop of this, and, you know, taste, now taste this one, taste that one. And so ultimately... He's the chef. He knows what the fuck he's doing. And I'm the sorcerer's apprentice where I'm at his elbow. And I ultimately get to say which one is yummy. Right. <laughs> and then and then he's like, thanks to Nick Offerman's expert pal. <laughs> and they try to they try to goose it up as though I know what the fuck I'm doing. Which yeah. all I'm doing is saying I like number seven B. Um, and And so I love it. I mean, I also write all the copy on the back of the box and like... You know, I pitch sort of jokes. There's little illustrations of me and stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm very active in it because I, whether it's my books or anything that I endorse, I don't, you know, I, I don't put my name on something if, if I don't stand behind it and I try to be as involved as possible just so because I think it's douchey to just. Yeah. If, 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 if it was just my name, I don't think anybody would pay me for that. But right, right. Well, you, well, you did uh, also in Parks and Rec. Isn't your character? It's Elmo's a steakhouse, right? Is um, it Saint Elmo's? Saint Elmo's in, in Indianapolis. Yeah. yeah. Was that you, or is that they're like the character is gonna? Is that a thing that you brought in, or did they just say like, oh, he's gonna like this steakhouse? Oh well, I mean, they you know great TV writers. What the, their alchemy is? They take aspects of your personality and distill them. In a way, where the you know whether it's Aziz or Aubrey Plaza or Amy or me, when they were creating the show, I was in my wood shop. I actually have a wood shop in L.A., and I kept talking to them on the phone. We're cre- like before we ever started, and I would have to turn off the table saw or whatever the <laughs> dust collection, and and eventually they were like, "Wait, are you? What is this?" And I said, "It's I have a wood shop. I I build heirloom furniture and boats and shit." And they said, can we come over there? And they got on a bus and all the writers came to my shop and they said, this is hilarious. Like, <laughs> can we make your character a woodworker? And I, was, I said, yeah, great. I love it. Uh, so so on the show, Ron's shop is my shop. And, my, and so uh, somehow my love of meat, uh, there are certain aspects of me that they then like crank up to a superhero level. Right. <laughs> so in the... In my touring show, I do a song called I'm Not Ron Swanson, and there's a line that's like, uh, he can eat a big-ass steak for every single meal because his colon is fictitious, but mine is all too real. (laughs) (laughs) And his scotch intake would be my liver's doom. Right. Because mine is controlled by nature and his by the whims of the writer's room. Um, (laughs) Humorous. So that's that's a humorous. But you did have a, you had a couple drinks with us and he had a 5 a.m. pickup the next day and he still had a couple drinks with us before he left. I was like, that's a fucking, that's a, a that's not a humorous, that's a comedian right there. Hell (laughs) yeah. My bona fides. Oh, wait, I had a question. Shit. Oh, I lost it. What were you talking about? 
Ron Swanson steak. Oh, meat. we got it back. Thank you. Now, be honest. My wife watches the show a lot. She loves the show. She puts it on all the time. She's wildly attracted to you. That character. She's like, he's so manly. Is he so masculine? You must get dozens and dozens of letters. That's a, that's an interesting question, uh, and I'm I, that I'm suddenly resentful um, because I I feel like I should oh, <laughs> be, no. be getting a, a lot of mail. Um, Come on, you're a good looking guy, great I'm, hairline. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thanks to your your bride. Um, I uh, she's here, by the way. She uh, wants to. No, my my um, <laughs> I. I think because I, I used to get a lot of fan mail early on, and I used to on Sundays I would I used to really enjoy answering my fan mail, mm -hmm. and that was about uh, 2009 10, and then re one of the reasons Parks and Rec I think hit because we almost got canceled every year. We were never a right, hit show. Right. Um, in later years, once streamers showed up, then it became wildly popular with young people, and th they don't understand that we almost got canceled all yeah. the time. We barely I feel like it's the same with 30 Rock, The Office, Seinfeld. all these classic comedies. It's not true, though. Uh, the Office was a hit, was a ratings hit. But it Out blew up on another level, though, on Netflix. For right? sure. Yeah. It, it, absolutely. That's also true. I mean, in, in this weird new advent of like comfort shows, mm -hmm. because for the first time, even post cable, you could just have your show available. Yeah. And just watch it over and over. Um, but uh, so somewhere towards the beginning, suddenly when, when Parks and Rec did uh, take off to the extent that it did, I was suddenly hugely unable to return fan mail. Like it. Yeah. It, it exploded. And, and, in order to like just maintain any personal time, I also had to not really engage on social media. And so wherever that would exist, if if anyone is soliciting my sexual favors, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm unaware. I'm really unaware of it. Like, wow, it's out there. Trust I'm glad. Me. I'm frankly glad. To, I'm grateful because, <laughs> you know, my wife and I have a, a great thing and, and we still maintain a, a healthy amount of heat between us. And so I'm also grateful that it hadn't occurred to me. But I was like, <laughs> where are the, the... I do hear on occasion from the sort of bear uh, oh, community. Oh, I bet. Um, well, de depending on what, what facial hair I'm rocking. Right, right. Well, you're an alpha. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Uh, I, you're a top? Uh, oh. I mean... In that world. Yeah, by, by and large, I suppose. Yeah, are the well, bears always the top? I didn't even know that. I assume they're the, I mean, they're the bigger, but I, know, but, yeah, but I don't know what the hell the bears go at it from time to time. Yeah, so sure. Bears I'm not K. sure. Yeah, I think I think you can be a pitcher or a catcher yeah. as a bear. I would, have, I would All, And I'm relatively ignorant, but I do know there are bears and there are cubs. Yeah. Yes. Because I've met cubs, uh, and generally, I you know, to, I hate to make a stereotype, but cubs are probably more likely to be found on the bottom of I would think so. <laughs> yeah, any well, arrangement especially in the in baseball they're in the bottom of the division <laughs> well <laughs> boy good. that's Chicago. they're my they're my team <laughs> oh it's just a bunch of Burt Kreischers and, and I wish photos. I wish I could argue with you <laughs> well I've been called an otter what I'm, is that that's like a scruffy skinny guy I'm not hmm. a twink level that's too small I'm like an otter and then I think you're a giraffe <laughs> I would assume. I, are we allowed to say twin? Because I remember doing on at, I did that show at midnight back in the day, and Jesse Joyce was like helping with my punch up of the jokes, and I said twin, and he goes, "You can't say that." And I was oh. like, "This guy wrote roast jokes for Greg Giraldo. He's telling me I can't say this." You know, I didn't know that was. Uh, yeah, offensive. I don't know. Huh? I don't know. I, I didn't know that either. I mean, I thought it was. I don't know. Uh, Maybe not. I, I, it's a cute word, twin. I, su I, yeah, I mean, I, su I suppose in some circles it could be considered derogatory. Circle That's not how we mean it, though. But yeah, right. I, I, th I thought it was just a category of like a Me puckish too. or fairy like. Yeah, fairy. Uh, He's co co <laughs> with an e, f a e r i e. Oh, right, right. R -I -E. <laughs> yes, like Staten Island. Like the fairy. wee folk. Got it. Got it. Well, like a nymph. That's we, right. Not to make too like obvious a, a segue here, but the, <laughs> yeah. the gay character you played on Last of Us is incre that's an incredible episode. Of great TV. arc. Thank you. That was like, it, it, it was a slow and, burn. And great segue. <laughs> yeah, killer. Killer. But it, I mean, I was watching that and I was just like, the the way it was like a short it was yes. like a film it wasn't like an episode of TV it was uh, the, the I mean and you know hats off to Neil Druckmann who created the video game 
uh, uh, but Craig Mazin, oh, yeah. who who did the show Chernobyl, mm. and also uh, Craig Mazin also wrote Hangover Two. Like he, <laughs> what is he, that right? He has the most incredible arc uh, at the time. What a his, range! His son was on a little league team that my wood shop sponsored. So one of my little league dads, and he wrote movies uh, like it's called superhero movie. Uh, at least a couple of the scary movies. Oh, wow. So he's this great... Big... Which ones did he write? Can you look it up? So he knows comedy. He's this great big brain that like writes, creates these satires of a form. Mm. And then one of my Little League dads wrote Hangover 2. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. What... It's so incredible. Cut to... He had the idea for Chernobyl. And nobody would make it, of course. Because they're like, what are you... you're going from Hangover to this... And so he, he kind of had to make it on his own. He had to produce it himself. And, of course, it won every award. Yeah, and is great. I an know, astonishing... I, I got to watch it. Everyone's told me to watch awesome. it. I got I to gotta put that on. It's, it's incredible. It, we, we, it, it stopped us up in the beginning of the pandemic when it came on because it's fucking Chernobyl. Like, it's nothing is more bleak. Yeah. It's, it's a true depiction, and, like, people are melting from yes. radiation and shit. So we yeah. shut it off for a year and a half. And then <laughs> came back to it, and it's it's worth it. It's that actor from Mad Men, right? It's uh, Jared Harris. Yeah, that guy's incredible. Son of Richard Harris. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That guy could put him back. Richard oh, really? Harris. Yes, he was, he was like a legendary. Director. Yeah, they would. I mean, those guys and and Peter O'Toole and oh and, yeah and uh, um, oh, what's his name? I believe it was a sir now. Probably. Yeah. They would, uh, uh, Oliver Reed, they, they would do Shakespeare on the West End, and at intermission, they'd go across the alley to the pub, and the stage manager would have to go pull them back on stage <laughs> for their <laughs> entrance. And they, you know, generally, they would come out and successfully elocute Shakespearean <laughs> monologue. You know, they would destroy the audience, just well, totally shit faced. There's these old Hollywood stories of Spencer Tracy being such a blackout drunk that the studio would hire people to shadow him and oh. have to like carry him into a car oh, so sure. there wouldn't be an article. And you're like, holy shit. Not not stop drinking. It's like, oh no, we'll help you. Right, yeah. right. We'll help you get this drunk. <laughs> Shepherd. That's <laughs> it's, great. It's a crazy thing. Um, Craig Mazin uh, wrote that episode, and mm. and and so I mean that. Uh, and I, I guess I guess I'll tell. Well, no, I'm not gonna. This tell wasn't story. in the video game. I assume there wasn't a weird. Uh, it's it's a random gay. Couple. It's touched upon. Oh, it is. Yeah. Um. And and most people breeze by. Like you had to really dig in deep to understand uh, that they had a relationship. So. Uh, this uh, here are sp some minor spoilers for the last of us video game please uh which i've never seen beyond seeing like stills of the character mm -hmm. uh you meet my character and he's angry and he has these interactions with the leads frank you is i think you meet i think he's he's hung himself mm -hmm. and so you understand that they had a relationship and you see Franks writes a letter about uh, the, there's something about a partnership like it's it's intimated and then also in Bill's bunker you find gay porn magazines oh, I think so there are clues and Frank talks about their part being partners but the letter that you find it's really well done on on Neil's part it's angry Right. Like it's it's like fuck I always fucking hated you. Like I'm killing my this is my suicide note. Ooh. And I hated you. But but if you if you get all the clues, you're like, "Oh, you, you were lovers." Like yeah. this is this is a marriage. You got to hand it to we've come a long way since Frogger. You know, <laughs> depth and relationships totally. and hidden hidden meanings. Yeah, this is this has all the nuance of I feel like video joust. games make more money than movies now, right? <laughs> It's Killer. pretty crazy. I I gave um, me personally in the late '90s. I played a couple of games and lost a couple of weeks to them. Oh yeah, I had that Banjo Kazooie and Earthworm Jim. Oh, I loved Earthworm Jim. And it was the same guy. This is all about Scott King, the guy who gave me my first Lagavulin. Was the first couch I surfed when I got to L.A. And he's a wonderful, brilliant. Uh, uh, Brainiac. We made a, a really weird movie called Treasure Island that I'm really mm -hmm. proud of. It was at Sundance in 98. Mm -hmm. I was couch up. surfing with him. He was a gamer and he was like, hey, I just got these two new games. Do you want to basically eat pizza all day for two weeks and play video games? And I was like, yeah, yeah man. <laughs> Hollywood is awesome. Yeah. 
So we did, and we we methodically beat each of the two games. Wow. And then at the end of those two weeks, I might as well have been masturbating for two weeks because I was like, that was amazing. <laughs> and as soon as it's over, I was like, what the fuck did I do? <laughs> I just lost two weeks of my life. This is pre-Megan Mullally. It is pre-Megan. Okay, yeah, because yeah. I can almost hear her vagina drying up. No, <laughs> you were from jimming all day. Everywhere. <laughs> no, I met her but a year or two later, and, and my life got very happy. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I've never needed another PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, you talk about it like it was a heroin phase. I did that for a while, and I got out of it. Then it I met my wife. I'm very grateful. Yeah, I've had those lessons in life where I've had the opportunity to try something without getting arrested or or killed, and to, enough to say, oh, I, I get it. I get why people throw their lives away on narcotics right. or video games or whatever it is. And for me, uh, I have an addictive personality, so I'm thankfully able to say all right that's enough of that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, we were talking before you got here matt and i about uh the episode you did of last of us and it's like first off i think it's cool as hell that you don't see a lot of like badass gay characters on screen right, right. like yeah. your character is like a survivalist badass got a gun got a camera set up but then we were talking we're like was he gay or was did he, the, know he was gay? did he know he was gay or does, does he show up and he's like I'm lonely because mm. I was thinking about it I was watching with my girlfriend this episode and I was kind of like I don't know if I would be gay in, a, in this type of environment then by the end of the episode I'm like oh I would definitely have been gay right because it was like a meaningful relationship and that's right. the only type of relationship you could have well I mean to, to sort of answer uh, your intimated question I I think he was I think yes uh, he knew he was gay, but he was powerfully closeted. Yeah. Ah. You know, when, when the world still existed, that was that part of his bitterness was like he was going to be goddamned if he was going to be gay because he, because he didn't he didn't fit the stereotype like because he, he was also this badass. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt so lucky to get the job because they needed a guy who could use a shovel. And there's, there's only three of us in Hollywood. <laughs> Harrison Ford passed, and Jane Lynch was not available. <laughs> and that's one of the two jokes that I've written. I've written two jokes. That's a great joke. That's a good joke. Since I became a humorist. Uh, lesbian jokes, they always work. <laughs> I was pretty happy, but I said it to Mateo Lay, my friend who's a gay guy the other day. I was like, you know, gay guys make neighborhoods nicer. And I said, but do lesbians? He goes, they build them. Ah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, they're they're not they're not as as visible in the parade because they're they're fixing the floats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, woo! But yeah, that, that's it's so cool that you've done these like. Is it is it okay to to perpetuate? Positive stereotypes like lesbians are great with tools. Yeah, I, think so. I don't see why black guys big dicks, well, Asians are smart. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly what I, I mean, so no. Well, that's the Jewish one is always so we were like Jews are successful. These pieces of shit. I'm like, that's your zing. I know, but there also a lot of the conspiracy theories end with Jews eat babies. There's a lot of bad uh, ones. Sure, you too. wait long enough. That's why you don't see a lot of Jewish conspiracy theorists because we see where they end up. They don't. Babies aren't kosher. You know how can that work? Lesbians are heroic. And Unless they're Rothschilds, yeah, is the, <laughs> is the headline. Do you? Right. So it's so cool. You've been in these movies that are like. First, you've been in so many funny movies and funny parts, but then like, are you kind of more hungry for these dramatic roles now? Um, it's a good question. I, uh, like I said earlier, I, I wanted to get good parts in plays in Chicago theater. I went to theater school at the University of Illinois. Um, which is kind of funny at it, it, Champaign-Urbana in the middle of the cornfields, but it's actually a great theater school that prepares you, that teaches you how to stand and perform Chekhov. Um, but, uh, and, and so in Chicago theater, I, I had a theater company with my friends called the Defiant Theater. And uh, you, you kind of do whatever is in your toolbox, whatever is on the season. And so I love doing comedy, but I also love being a scary motherfucker. Like, the only time I really won a good award for acting was in a play in 1995 called The Kentucky Cycle. Mm. Um, and uh, that's me in The Kentucky Cycle. Uh, <laughs> I, I wore a suit and I was very tired. Uh, I um, it, it was a seven hour play. It was this Pulitzer Prize winning play by uh, Robert Schenken. 
and I played an Irish indentured servant who was a murderer, and, and, and it was a scary motherfucker that you love to hate. Uh-huh. And so that, I thought, was my bag. I thought I was like Alan Rickman in, in Robin Hood, where I was like, or, or Die Hard. Like, yeah. Um, and I thought that was my niche. Um, but then I also love making people laugh. And so I don't really, uh, my, my ambitions don't lie in genre. I have been lucky enough to just kind of be open to, uh, I read what comes in and like, after Parks and Rec, I never dreamed that I would get that I would have such a effective comedy character. Yeah. And, and it took the genius of Mike Schur and his writers' room, and and, and Greg Daniels, um, and all all these, and, and Dan Gore who created created Brooklyn Nine Nine, like they thought of what to do with this, yeah, uh, in, in so much more of a clever way than I ever could have come up with. And so then after 125 episodes of that, then I got these great offers from Hot Shots uh, with TV deals that were like, and I was like, okay, the one thing I don't want to do, obviously, is another Ron Swanson. And they're like, yes, of course, uh, us either. So we have this guy, he's like an ex-Marine, he's great at grilling, <laughs> you know, and they, so yeah. I got like three offers of yeah. huge jobs that were just another, you know, he's, he's known for his mustache or whatever. Sure. And I and I was like, thank you so much, but that's like too similar. I, I, yeah, I think I'm not thin. Uh, my my ambitions aren't shallow enough. I could just make a ton of money playing a guy with a mustache for the rest of my life. Yeah, then you're the one note guy. Yeah, yeah. Or, and, but isn't it a hard line to walk between between being the one note guy and also like, well, this is what people want. I mean, I, I feel know. I feel like you can look at a lot of Jim Carrey's movie movies in the '90s, and he's kind of doing a or similar Bill character. Bill Murray, or Bill Murray, sure. or, or Will sure. Ferrell, even I, you know, who I, are all great. I but, agree, right. and it's and it, and that's the thing is like, and we all have our our you know our certain toolboxes. Like, I, when I went to theater school, I aspired to be more of like a Gary Oldman or Daniel Day Lewis, yeah. where you become a little more unrecognizable. And I think I, I walk the line between because generally it's hard to disguise my voice. People generally, although in the Lego movie, uh, I play Metal Beard, the pirate. Oh, yeah. And I sound like a weird Irish pirate. <laughs> and that's the one time that somebody let me do something that doesn't sound like this fucking guy. It's weird because they want Nick Offerman for the voice, and then yeah. you, you come in with that voice. Are they annoyed? No, it was really fun. It was a Lord and Miller uh, who who make like the Spider-Man multiverse things, and they made the 21 Jump Street movies and uh, the After Party. The, these guys are brilliant and prolific. And, th and so we're in a Warner Brothers uh, recording studio, and... Um, and I were messing around and, and, and the character had a song. And so I start, I was just fucking around, you know, like in a stoned way, playing with voices. And we happened upon that voice and they let me do it. And I was, I was so grateful um, that yeah. for once they, I didn't have to sound like this. But to, to answer your question, so I don't, I don't care if it's funny or dramatic. I was just telling uh, a friend uh, I just I just signed on to produce and and be a supporting actor in an independent film that came my way uh, by a total unknown. It's kind of his first script, and it's a fucking hilarious, brilliant script. And I I got a hold of the guy, and I was like, "Where the fuck did you come? From? Like, this is great." Yeah. And I the reason I read everything is because. By God, at some point that motherfucker is going to show up. You never know, and it's and it's so inspiring. And so my buddy and I are going to help produce this movie. Um, oh, I love that. And it's and it makes you cry, and it's really funny. It's a great script. So um, when I when I was getting offered those post Ron Swanson roles, I talked to my agents and I said, you know what, I'm just going to go to my wood shop and make some shit, and let's create some daylight. Let's create a vacuum because nature abhors that. And sure enough, after a couple months of like saying no to stuff, Alex Garland called me, who made the movie Ex Machina, oh, uh, yeah. Annihilation. Great movie. To be Ex in this, Machina is like incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. It's a masterpiece. He, he, for me, he's like the Kubrick of our day. Hell yeah. And uh, or or if if you're a, 
a douche, the Kubrick of our day, <laughs> if you say Bertolt Brecht. Right. Um, <laughs> right. But he, he wanted to meet me to do this sci-fi series called Devs. And I was, was standing in my wood shop when I got this call, and I started crying. I was like, it fucking worked. <laughs> like, Kubrick called me. Yeah. You know, I, I said no to all the grill guys. And now I get to do this <laughs> beautiful series. That, Although you have to have a mustache in his movie. Um, and I, talk about uh, it. I, I, I did have a beard, but I'm pretty unrecognizable. Oh, cool. Oh, great. Yeah. He, and he didn't require it. That was my choice. Good. It, That's, it's cool that scripts are still coming in because, you know, you just we see the same Marvel and even Top Gun. Like, they do well, and it's great that theaters are still open yeah. and movies are being made. But it's nice to hear when a... Just a great script comes through. You're like, all right, let's do this. It is. It's and it's interesting. On on, I'm lucky enough to uh, experience tastes of both ends of the rainbow because I I have a supporting role in the uh, Mission Impossible movie that's coming out next summer. Wow, is another one? Which yeah, it's this the seven. It's this. This is eight. Eight. Wow. It's, it, and it's the second half of seven <laughs> so it's it's called dead reckoning one and two okay and those chris mccrory who makes those he's made something like a dozen movies with tom cat since like uh valkyrie oh you yeah know, and and that was so fascinating because i don't ever work on that level on big sure. studio things um, what type of character is it um I, I, I'm not sure. Drill. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this guy, it's a guy with uh, a really masculine beard. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, I, I feel like I'm trying to remember what has been, what's out there. I, I I'm a, uh, I'm a high. I think I can safely say I'm a high up uh, military presence. Gotcha. Um, I don't want you know. I don't want to. Do you, do you have scenes with Tom Cruise? I can't remember. <laughs> um, was there a guy on an to, Apple box? To be honest, oh. but but the um, but the thing the thing was it. I mean, you know, it was fucking fascinating. Like these guys, while we were shooting, uh, I don't know. Now I'm getting confused in my years, but at least a year ago, yeah, it was a year ago, a year and a half ago, while we're shooting. The new Top Gun came out, with which our writer director Chris McQuarrie wrote. Wow! And so he and Tom, uh, you know, are coming to work every day, and they're mo we're, so we're working shooting while their movie passed a billion dollars yeah. in like a month. So they're feeling Same good. Summer. And so yeah. there's that sensibility of like they're really and when they when when uh, Chris McQuarrie uh, they call him McHugh when he uh, you know set up a call to offer me to ask me to come do the job. His opening line, I hadn't met him, so this is us meeting, and he said, so this is really fun, and he, he's a really funny, smart, personable guy. You would think somebody like that would be, I don't know, I feel like James Cameron would be hard to talk sure. to, and he probably is, because um, yeah. he he's openly said that he doesn't like actors. But Oh, um, really? Yeah. What a weirdo. Uh, sure. I mean... They helped him not, make a billion dollars, but that's yeah. cool. He doesn't need them. He just needs <laughs> computer versions of them. Right. But Chris McQuarrie yeah. uh, is incredibly personable. So we get on the phone, and he was literally in South Africa. They had just shot, you know, Tom Cruise, like, jumping off a fucking rocket ship. And um, and he said, Nick, so here's the deal. Uh, here's how we make these movies. We jump out of an airplane, and we start sewing a parachute as we're ah. falling. <laughs> like, we, we know where we want to get to. We get all these people together and, and you know, we start shooting yeah. and we like literally make it up as we go. And, and so, what? so I got my first pages of script day one sitting in the hair and makeup chair. They brought me my first pages of script. So you don't know what you're doing. That's correct. That's I mean, I, I know I know my character and I know the circumstance, but there, and there's like eight of us in this big scene. And so we all <laughs> at the last minute are like, hey, nice to meet you. I'm just I'm learning my lines <laughs> as I'm about to go oh into my, my first day, you know, working with with these A-list actors. Sure. And so it's very different from all the theater and indie film shit that I'm that I'm used to. But it's fascinating. And and it was interesting because on 
a certain level, you know, you can't argue with their that, that, that they make very successful, that they're the best at what they do. Yes. Well, we need both. They, exactly. And um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm very, I feel very lucky that I, you know, get to put my dip my toe into the separate waters. Yeah. Yeah. I just worry that the indie is going away. So I'm glad like it's good to have a Pulp Fiction and a Forrest Gump. You know, but I worry without <clears throat> DVD sales to maybe like prop up an office space. Yeah, we talk about this all the time on the pod. We love we love movies. We love you know obscure movies. We love big budget stuff too. But but yeah, I agree with Mark. We we need the kind of you need like a sideways too. Yes, you know? yes. totally, hundred percent. And I and I I'm an optimist, but I don't think it can ever go away because that's the one thing you can never replicate. Like. uh to each their own. Like I, I'm not. I'm not interested in shitting on Marvel movies, for example. No. But but they're not my bag, and they. And here's the and here's the thing. I mean, I, th- I've thought about this quite a bit because I I actually auditioned to play Wolverine when. Wow. And there, there's a crazy story. That's uh, hilarious. Uh, because, Wolverine, if he just got divorced. This was like, <laughs> this was '98 or '99 when they when they made the wow. first one, and it was. Um, uh, Brian uh, Singer, Singer, mm. who, who great made guy. First I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, uh, he's very friendly. I've, I've, <laughs> I've been given to understand. Um, the they cast a, Can- a Canadian actor named Doug Ray Scott, and he was doing a Mission Impossible movie, right. and they they kept ki- holding him to they wouldn't release him, and so Hugh Jackman got flown in for day one without ever having met Brian Singer. So he, and he ended up, of course, you know, getting a lifetime career of this role of Wolverine, which, which sure. he killed it, was incredible at. And, and I remember hearing about it, like, who the hell is Hugh Jackman? This, yeah. is, X, this is X-Men, you know? Exactly. And now I'm like, oh, that guy, he's pretty good. Yeah, he's a but I remember at the time my friends like, it should be Mel Gibson. I was like, yeah, Mel Gibson. And then five years later, I was like, good thing it's not Mel Gibson. Yeah, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a different movie. <laughs> but though, uh, I, I was a big uh, fight choreographer for the stage. I love sword fighting, and I, I love combat. I love Jackie Chan. Like, sure. I love the sense of swash story. Butler. And it's something that I miss uh, in, in with modern CGI and editing it's very rare that you see a cool character with the panache of like Gene Kelly. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's going to beat somebody up, very rarely do they like bing, like flip a prop right. and catch it. And you're like, oh man, they're fucking cool as hell. Now it's all editing or it's CGI. They do something super cool, but you know they didn't really have to learn to do it. Right. And that to me personally, uh, when CGI took over, and it's not just the Marvel movies, which is like one one fantastical movies. Now, uh, Doctor Strange is one that I love the comic, but there's nothing Doctor Strange can do or Thanos or you name it that I'm going to be like, how the fuck did they do that? But if you go back and watch Indiana Jones, you're like, holy, like, you know, those those props, those stunts are yeah. physical and real. Yes. The guy slides under the truck with that whip and all like yeah. all that shit. You're like, holy shit, you know that. And that's a big part of why Tom Cruise still sells so well is because, you know, he's doing that. They show you. Here's Tom Cruise jumping off a cliff on a motorcycle. And it's insane. Like, yeah. He's still doing it. It really is. I mean, they really, w- we saw a bunch of footage cut together. Uh, it was on his 60th birthday. Oh, my God. And, and he, What's he running from? How he, does he have that in him still? He could just put his feet up in Barbados and take it easy. Um, wh- how, why is there a picture of me as Wolverine? <laughs> oh, we got a lot of windows <laughs> open. That's pretty incredible. What does he do? Yeah, oh, I mean, my God. Oh, this is apparently the biggest stunt in movie history. Uh, whoa, Come on, man! I mean, th- oh, that's that's my, my cue. God, that's my cue to shit my pants. <laughs> Come on, man! He did that. Jesus. Yeah. And they they showed us a bunch of footage that uh, that is going to be in in number eight. Of, of them getting Christ. up to some tomfoolery with a couple of biplanes. <laughs> oh, I, I, and, I like and, straight planes. And thank, thankfully, <laughs> we're—I uh, mean, yeah, they, um, <laughs> we're standing next to them, and I and I, I was so t- tense from yeah. watching these stunts uh, that I, I was like, "Thank goodness you're standing here, because otherwise." 
there's no way somebody could survive what he does in these things. Yeah, I mean, Jesse Smollett must watch that and go, ah, shit. I'm a, I'm a hoax. I'm a fraud. Yeah. He's really doing it. It's true. It's uh, and, But so that, to me, is why we'll never lose the sense of, of indie films. That's why, you know, we're on strike right now partly because we have to get it in our contract that you can't replace us with AI. Good. Which is, I think, pretty reasonable. It is. Yeah. But, yeah. Of, but of course, also, you can just imagine the capitalists. Sure. Like, the, the, the big story that came out that they want to be able to hire an extra and create... By the way, this is... Uh, a friend of mine worked on um, the, the Fast and Furious where, uh, sadly, Paul Walker died in the middle of it, mm. and they had to, like, create him with four different guys and CGI wow. to finish the movie. A little weird. And ever since then, she was a makeup artist, and she came back and said, be careful, because from now on, any big-budget movie is going to build a digital version of you in case you die in, a, in an accident. Right, so Jeez. it started with pure motives, and then... Yeah, and, yeah, beware. and so, so now producers, for example, want to be able to hire an extra and build you so they hire you and pay you for one day so extras get fucked too Here, yes here's 30 dollars in a sandwich oh. and they build you and then they just use that software for the run of the movie wow and so it's it's extrapolate that into like now some people argue the other side of it where they're like well if if you the horse and buggy if you argument. sell the nick offerman software you could be making 10 movies at once and mm. make a lot of money and turn into a, a bigger asshole than you already are. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm an, I want to come down on the side of artistry versus commerce. And so I, I insist that there will never be anything approaching the magic of a human being. You like, hope. like put a person on stage and turn the lights on and you can, you, you can't beat that, whether it's on screen or stage. Yes. With something computer generated. It's fo phone sex versus real sex. You know, there's exactly. always going to be a winner. I was like fucking a sex doll. It's not even phone sex. It's not a person on the yeah. other. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good point. Yeah. That's a good point. So and so the for <laughs> for me, once CGI took over, and Doctor Strange does the most astonishing things, I'm I'm still left a little cold. Where I'm like, yeah, but. He didn't really do it, did he? And also right. the Marvel stuff, it, it, there's too many of them. Like, there's literally, like, once Disney Plus yeah. took over and started making, like, shows out of it, I was like, it, it's becoming insane. Like, I, I loved Star Wars growing up, but there were three of them. Yeah. Now there's, like, all these extended universes, which is fine, but you do take away the magic. I love The Sopranos. I didn't like the movie. You know, it just right. it, it lost the magic for me. I think sometimes you take that time off, too, and, and the magic's gone. Sure. It'll be interesting, too, to talk to, like, the next generation, uh, because we both are referencing early Indiana Jones or Star Wars, where I would argue that, like, the weird fucking aliens at the nightclub playing instruments. The cantina. They have the magic of the Muppets, where you know eh. they exist in physical reality. Right. And if you give me a cartoon, even a, a realistically rendered cartoon of the cantina... It's, it, I'm just not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna feel the same pull. Yeah. But I wonder if like Gen Z kids or whatever. I don't they think they don't care. care. They don't care. They don't. Care I don't think anything. they. I don't think they care about artists. I don't think they like if an artist paints these you know amazing paintings with a brush. It's different than doing it computer generated. Yeah, right they're now. just swiping. They're just scrolling. You know? I was at a museum more more. earlier looking at some woodwork at an art museum, and <clears throat> there were these cool artifacts on the wall that drew my eye. And I was talking to the docents, uh, and I was like, wow, these are really cool. I can, when you get up close, you can see that it's made out of plywood, and they're dyed pink. And then I realized they were made with a CNC, a computer-driven ah. router. And I immediately was like, this is garbage. Like, I, I garbage. don't care about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's – nonetheless, it's – I don't even mean uh, – I don't want to fully denigrate uh, – but it lost the magic. Of like, course. It wasn't a sculpture. It wasn't sculpted. It's Yeah, it's like when we love stand-up comedy, obviously. When you go, oh, he has writers. You're kind of like, ah, oh, I thought it was out of his brain, mm. out of his point of view. Yeah, so when a comic a has writers, we always lose a little respect. Because, you know, I understand if you have a TV show, that's one thing. But for your stand-up, if you have writers, it's kind of, it loses the magic. Yeah. I, I understand that powerfully. I mean, yes, it's one thing. If you're doing a monologue every night, obviously. Sure. 
who can do that. But but yeah, if you're doing if you're touring an hour, that's that's your voice, you know. That, yeah, exactly. That makes a difference. You want Rodney. That's you don't right. you don't want the team. But yeah. Oh, I had another thing. Shit. I lost it. Ron ah. Swanson. No, no. Do you want to do peeves or anything? Yo, we should do peeves. Oh, yeah. Can we do, oh right. We you didn't sent talk in, about did our assignment. Oh. I did send in peeves, and I even thought of another one. Please. Uh-oh. Uh, does anybody have what I sent in? And I'll pick between. Okay. Yeah, we do have. We'll pull I mean, it you up. can do them all. Oh, I remember what I want to say. We'll, we'll fill the time. I did see the <clears throat> Indiana Jones new movie. Email. And the AI is unbelievable because they make them look young, and it's pretty convincing. I mean, sure. There's every every conversation requires nuance. You sure, know? There, sure. There's good and bad to all of it. Of course, of course. But the whole time you're just watching, going, "I can't believe they pulled this off." Instead I, of, "This is a good movie." I mean, I have I have a book that I want well, to adapt. Ah, let me a taste into a film, and it's it's a guy's life story. And I can play the guy probably from, a, I'm 53, I can, you know, with makeup, I could probably play the guy from like 40 on. Sure, sure. But there's, there's some great scenes of the guy at 20, like riding a horse and he's a, a period farmer. Yeah. And so I'm, even as I'm conceptualizing the movie, I'm like, do I, what do I do? And I, and I think I would rather cast, try and cast somebody close right. to me. I then, think that's cooler though. You get two performances. Like they did that movie on Brian Wilson, and you get John Cusack playing him older, and, and Paul, Paul Dano, Dano yeah. and they get two great performances. Yeah. Right, right. I understand that 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 is costing the studio more money, but I think it made the movie so much better. I, I agree, and I I'm trying to get Cusack to play the young. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going younger. We'll see. <laughs> Joan Cusack. There we go. While I'm stretching for time here, Mark. You, can you uh, share with him the story from Conan that you shared earlier? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll just it was you had a great line. I met you for eight seconds, like a rodeo. And uh, I was in, they didn't like my outfit, so they had to give me a button down to wear. So I was in a robe. And you walked by and said, shave the boy and send him to my room. <laughs> and I got a huge laugh in the room. And that was it. Fantastic. So always fun when you can get a zing in. I remember that. Riff. No. that and that, I mean, that. Um, that's like a Mel Brooks thing or something. I'd have him shaved and sent to my room. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. We got it killed. Yeah, I don't write some jokes. of Nick's peeves here. Um, people uh, cutting off in traffic is the first one. Um, yeah. Well, let's jump to number three: podcasts of aimless chat. <laughs> <laughs> which, um, which, which I is is I thought might get a laugh, but also is for real. Like. It's a thing. So now every, I mean, for years now, everyone has a podcast. Of course. And the, like, I've, and, and I enjoy them or despise them like anybody, like anything. You know, I, I love some country. I hate some country music. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but when, when, I, when, I, when there are people that I like and I'm like, oh, cool, I'm going to check out their podcast. And you tune in. And they're like, hey, here I am in my, my garage in Denver with my two friends. <laughs> and they proceed to talk about a laundry anecdote for the first 28 minutes. I've done that one. And I'm like, <laughs> with a, like I, don't, you, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's people who don't think they're cuter than oh, they are. Totally, totally. Where it's like, hey, I fucking love your, you drew me to your podcast. Now, Indulgence. At least drive towards some content. Like, yes. And it's it's before they bring their guest out, and it's uh, you know. I mean, it's a crazy stat, but they say I think two percent of podcasts make it past twenty episodes. Oh, that's wild! So it's wildly like we're in the way way upper echelon just with a certain amount of episodes. Well, well, dude, it, the amount of pods that will do that it it is insane, and that's why we try to have some structure at this. But uh, it's. What's well, a good mix? It's, yeah. but, but you're you're intelligent, curious people, and so the conversations. You didn't do half an hour before I got here. That's that's the, what kills me. We did like fifteen minutes, I think. Minutes, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just to build it up. But but you but you're driving towards something. Like you guys are interested in the world. It's yes. not. It's it's navel gazing that mm. where, and and when a pod even podcasts of people that I love, if there's three hosts, I'm always like. I don't want to do that podcast because I'm like, I'm not going to get to talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's that's why we don't let them talk. You're it's all brutal. funny, yeah. <laughs> Would you mind going in the hallway? <laughs> <laughs> but 
But here's something I want to touch on because I want to, there's a little bit of a PSA to it because it just happened to me again. And this is a little bit rarefied. All right. Be, be, because it involves uh, Funko Pop dolls. Funko but it, Pop. But it doesn't have to. Are. But for me specifically, here's, here's the peeve. Autograph people now do a thing. Oh, I've seen these. They, oh, uh, no. they now do a thing uh, where they find out they have people on the inside at airlines. Uh-huh. Put in, uh, see how many Ron Swanson ones you can find, please. Oh. Uh, they have people at the airline. I've seen this. And they find out when you're flying in to Philly, to Cleveland, to Vancouver, and they fucking hit you at baggage claim. Oh. They get in somehow. There, there are, for, for these dolls, they want you to sign them. Yeah, so there's at least there are at least eight of these. There's eight versions of Ron Swanson. Wow, Ron, that's pretty good. It's yeah, that's that's uh, pillbox hat dancing Ron. <laughs> <laughs> but baggage claim is already held. You've gotten off the flight. Now you're waiting. And yeah, so with the bag. So specifically for me, because because these and and I really would like to maybe do some homework to find out what are you actually getting for a Funko Pop that I've signed because these guys show up and it's always big bearded guys. Yes. And there's no way they're keeping it, right? Or oh, no, 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 no. it's clearly mm. like the, it's openly cuz they have several. They have a bag of right. stuff. A good way to ruin that for them is let me make it out to you. Ooh. Well, no, I I try that, but they they the, just the they autograph? get around it. They have learned 800 clams. <sighs> I mean, you could get a real job for the amount of work it takes to go to the well, airport, what, get in, get that's these funk. What I say to them, so, so a, please, do, I, I basically a long time ago, even before these dolls, I began saying to uh, professional autograph people because they also meet you outside of Letterman or yeah. Colbert, and and when they have it taped off, and, and it's obviously going yeah. to a collector like like a sale, I just say I don't want to encourage this, like. You're a parasite, and I'm friendly about it, but I'm like, what the fuck are you doing with your life? Like, how long are you hanging out here at baggage claim? And how much are you to roll the dice that you can sell something I signed? And I always think of my wife, who's who is much more of like a sex symbol and like where I'm like, I don't want to encourage you to do this. Because then you're going to do it to people like my wife who oh, couldn't beat you up. Good point. And and because sometimes they show up at your hotel, and I'm like, don't please, don't. like I'm not going to, I'm not going to participate in this. And I did it recently, and these guys in Philly got in my face. Whoa! And I said, I said, listen, let's just take a breath, and and look at like take a step back. You're getting upset with me because I won't sign your doll. <laughs> and this and the and these guys are in Phil full fully uh Philadelphia Phillies gear uh-huh. wearing their jerseys and their hats and this guy gets up in my face this sad Philly fan and was like hey man we know where your show is like we know where your hotel is what? like like have fun have fun getting safety to hotel tonight the saddest Jeez. tough guys ever. and i was like a terrorist. wow yeah. man i and i you know i got my phone out and i'm like videoing the whole thing yeah and i went over to this tiny security guy they're talking to a mob boss he didn't sign the fucking doll <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey where's he my, didn't sign it <laughs> get jimmy get in here where's my, where's my funko pop <laughs> welcome uh, I went and found a tiny Asian elderly security guy and was like, hey, these guys, like, you know, and they were already gone. Yeah. He's like, I love Funko. But the P- <laughs> the P- the, P- the PSA is, please don't go to the fucking baggage claim and ask people to sign your shit. Like, That's crazy. Get a job. Yes. Like, like do something with your life. That's so sad and I, I had a weird. I had a weird yeah. situation in Toronto a few weeks ago. It was like a really fun gig. I was playing the Meridian Hall Theater. It was really exciting. And... I'm, it's part of the JFL festival, so I'm going in after Jenna Fisher and Angela Kin, Kinney, or Kinsey. Kinsey. They're doing their podcast before me in the venue, so all the fans out there are hoping to meet them. Right. And then they turn to me like, once they saw, once one person recognized me, they're like, "Oh, autograph!" And I'm like, "You know, I don't want to be your sloppy second. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's like you hit on the girl at the bar; she wasn't there. <laughs> you come to me." But right. I, I signed him. But ah, you signed the Jennifer. <laughs> I signed yeah, Angela yeah. Kinsey. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever seen the King of Comedy? Great movie. Yeah, yeah. of course. De Niro's profession in that movie. Rupert Pupkin. Rupert Pupkin. He's an autograph seeker, and he oh, that's right. He sells them. 
Damn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but but he, then he makes it. <laughs> Ma! The, the worst people always Ma! make it. Yeah. That's the moral of that story. Well, we yeah. have a Funko here. No. <laughs> I mean, you got another another peeve here with the the. What is it? The oh Stadiums. airport. Stadiums named after corporations. Oh, that's a great one. Oh, that's a God. great one. We're going to Nokia to see the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's like, so what? sadly American. I mean, we've we're, we've our fealty to our corporations is so complete that the poor White Sox are now playing in guaranteed rate field. Oh. Or the Padres play in Petco Park. Where it's yeah. Like, it's like Petco look. Park? I understand that you have to slather advertising across every available inch around the baseball field so i'm watching joey Votto, or like i'm watching some hero yeah and it's like you know hefty 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 <laughs> where i'm like this can't can i ha have my baseball i grew up in new orleans we had the superdome that was like our pride and joy and yeah. now it's the mercedes-benz superdome well, they did a great joke mm -hmm. about this in uh basketball where they were playing at maxi tampon arena <laughs> <laughs> love that well, the story lakers now play in crypto.com arena Oh well, well, before God. it was a Staples Center. It wasn't it like it was a cool, Staples. Kind of yeah. works, but yeah, yeah. Well, st Staples because there's a, there's a great R and B group, so you can mistake <laughs> right. it for like. Well, there's, there's also the Staples Center. I'll Who take you the, there. There's better some, than the R Kelly the Center. Office Depot. Uh, the Office Depot Arena or something. There's an Office Depot. Yeah, one, which totally totally sounds like bummer. the saddest fucking place in a strip mall. Yeah. Not not a place where a team plays. It is. I mean, and so, so you know, don't just complain. Offer a solution. My solution is get together, understand that if you can have class with your corporation, it's probably going to help your sales. Like, yeah. I would argue, I, I don't know that the Staples Center is like, um, by the way, I need some three-hole paper. Where, sh uh, where should we stop? <laughs> I know. Does it really After work? After the game. Oh. That's a good point. <laughs> You well, know. <laughs> I gotta next week. I'm doing the Funko Center, which is uh, <laughs> super annoying. But yeah, no, that's a great one. It's so true. It just it strips it with a it's a little less dignity, a little less fun. No, it's just corporations. And all I day. I love the Cubs. I mean, I'm a lifelong Cubs fan. My my whole, whole big family in Illinois, and we love going to Wrigley Field. And I I love uh, singing the stretch and throwing out the first pitch. And um, did you throw a strike? Uh, I have not thrown a strike yet. I. <sighs> I threw a ball, and then I've done it two more times. And I, one time I had my cousin do it. Maybe I, I don't. Or then the other time I had my dad do it. Oh, fun! Because um, we, we we bring a bus with like twenty four people. Um, so yeah, I I, I didn't th I did a whole bit with my dad. We planned this thing where we come out, and he and I. We, we plan this thing where we shake hands and I do an elaborate stretching uh -huh. and then I, I get lined up like I'm going to throw to center field. And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Other oh, <that's> way. <laughs> and so we spent all the time doing the bit and then I didn't like get settled before throwing the pitch because I'm a, like, I, you know, I got, I practiced for like a month. Of course, like, I you got to practice. You don't have a Fauci. But uh, it, it, it's something that, that I greatly enjoy and I love listening to both the TV guys and the radio guys. We have this great guy named Pat Hughes and Ron Coomer on the radio. And, and so quite often, I never have the luxury where I can sit and watch a game. Mm -hmm. But so quite often, like I'll be at my wood shop or I'll be doing getting something done. So I listen to the radio more than I have the TV guys. And the and both of them, it just it cracks me up. I mean, you could Christopher Guest could do a whole movie about it. Oh, where, yeah. Where they're like, okay, and you know, here's Nico Horner comes to the plate. Uh, the plate is sponsored by Solo Cups, and every <laughs> single thing has a scripted line, right? That that they can't get through an inning without hitting like eight endorsements. And uh. you're just like, guys, and they're great at casually just like throwing them out there. But I'm like, god damn it, why can't can't you it's just disgusting? Anyway, this podcast is brought to you by Champs.com. <laughs> I will um, to piggyback yeah. on your uh, your peeve. I will say with stadiums enough with the the music every two seconds. The, the, all right, everybody, here we go. How do you feel about this? We're doing the hokey pokey. Now we're doing that. And you're like, let me just enjoy it. I went to a soccer or football game in uh, London. I went to Arsenal. Mm. There's none of that. It's just game beer. It's all it, it's all for the kids. That's why. That's what it's it is. It's not I for guess. the adults anymore. It's but I I would offer in in British in European football uh or footy. Yeah. The thing that I envy them 
is in America, we get drunk uh, as a group and just scream violence and filth. And, and we're, oh, we're, we're fully prepared to fight each other and, and your kids. I'll beat your fucking kid up yeah, you're if, damn you, right. if he's wearing the wrong jersey. <laughs> in, in English football, they have a culture that, that predates, like is, is ancient, where the entire stadium will sing songs together. Yes. And they're clever and they're bite and sometimes they're, hor they're horrible they're and racist. Horrible, yeah, but they're fun. But the, my favorite was and and everyone knows, everyone joins in immediately. So yeah. instead of just like, you know, dot 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 like we're kindergartners, the whole stadium is singing to the other team, your support is fucking shit. Yes. <laughs> Whereas, like, everyone on Moss, and it's it's this, it feels like a gladiator arena. Yes, exactly. And it just, it's still drunken and boisterous, but it's like, you, you're, you and your team sucks in a, in a, in a group. It feels neighborly. Yeah. Instead of just like, uh, illiterate Even the screaming. cheers feel kind of corporate in a weird way. They're not, but it, oh, here, it, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, now you know what the other thing is. Every sports gambling was illegal. What three years ago? Now oh, every DraftKings, FanDuel, oh, Bet MGM. It's insane how it's, it went from illegal to like, is this mandatory? Do I have to bet on the yeah, game? Yeah, right. And again, it's in in the channels that you're watching and listening to with your kids, which I don't have kids, but I mean. It's fucking gambling. Like you, you, you know, we we've learned not to have me come on like selling Marlboros. Like we're like, okay, that's fucked the, yeah. in, in every way. And now suddenly, gam like you, and you even have athletes. You have baseball players being like, "Hey, it's me." Whatever. I, yeah. can't, I, I can't think of which one was on, so I don't want to say the wrong one. But it's it's me, Pete Rose. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, by the time, about time we forgave I'm him for that yeah, one. I'm putting fifty bucks on. You know, that would be great. In the middle of t <laughs> watching it on TV, and I'm I think that's upsetting. Yeah. Well, we, we act like this is a new thing. I mean, they used to have like the Velveeta Comedy Hour, you know, or the the Pennzoil or Variety Show. Brought to you by Chesterfield. There you go. You made me. Think Think of a bit I'm working on. I don't know if there's more here. Can I try a bit? Sure. Please. So this was you're talking about the fighting at the game or the you know the the drink the drink in the game, but like every football game now, it's like I, I watch the NFL and it's like every week there's a fight. There'll be women fighting. And my angle, one of my angles I want to try is um, you know, it's always a dude losing the fight who's in the opposing jersey. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you're the do you not realize you're the only one wearing green? What do you So I think uh, my angle yeah. is like that's not where you pick a fight. I'm a Jew, I'm not walking into a mosque. Like any of you pussies like Islam <laughs> <laughs> Let's dance. That's, right. that's hey, right. I'm gonna try it tonight. You're going in outnumbered. <laughs> Read the room. <laughs> Read yes, the room. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But on the flip side, the mosque guy will go into the the synagogue with the dynamite vest. And you're like, that's how you do it. Right. That's how you, you win against. You win. That's right. Hundreds. I, can I do it? Let me do a peeve too. I wrote hey, hit me with a peeve. Here's, I think I got a peeve. I as got well. a peeve. Um, hold on, hold on. Don't leave, Nick. Um, oh, I got a peeve. How about this? People, uh, I, I, when, when people say, uh, "I'm going to make an executive decision," that's a mm. fucking peeve. It's never like it's always at like uh, you're like a fucking restaurant. You're not right. a, you're not running a Fortune 500. You want to order chicken fingers? I fucking hate that shit. <laughs> you know, a bit. maybe uh, that's a bit. I don't know. Look, you guys take your time ordering, but I'm going to make an executive decision. <laughs> <laughs> and, can we get two guacs and one salsa for the table, please? Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, I got one. How about this one? This one's weird. I can't wrap my head around this one. I'm in a store, I'm kind of lost, and I go up to a guy and I go, hey man, do you work here? And he flips, he's like, fuck you, I don't work here, what do you think I work here? And I'm like, what's so bad about working here? I don't get why that's, that's the biggest insult it's also, on the planet. It's always a dude wearing a blue polo at Best Buy too. It was a guy in a red uh, shirt yeah. at Target. Yeah. Like, you're wearing a red shirt. So he's like, you can not You can see why I made the mistake. Yes, and wouldn't it be worse if you were? <laughs> like, what if he's like, I do. <laughs> I know, you got me. I think, I mean, yeah, I think it, it, it uh, taps into the stereotypes perhaps that we're afraid of. Like, 
Like I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of where would I be that I'd have that reaction? Uh, Maybe yeah. at Chippendales or <laughs> where I'd be like, no, fuck, I'm... <laughs> thunder down under. I have a BFA, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a compliment though. If they're like, do you work here? At I, I suppose, yeah, that's not yeah. a great example, but um, you're kind of insulting the people who do work here by getting that angry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, also, I, I, I have people say it to me, I don't give a shit. I'm like, I, oh yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't Sometimes I'm like, I, the bathroom's that way. Yeah, you, you know? try to help. Yeah. I'm, I'm at the comedy cell where people are like, I'm like, why don't I'm not the bouncer, but I'll fucking I'll show you where the bathroom is. Yeah, yeah why not? I, yeah. I don't get why I got so angry. I yeah. don't work here, but I do. I can tell a fucking Phillips head from a standard. So what can I do for you? <laughs> there you go, Home Depot. <laughs> so, do you was... have any? Uh, do you have any wrecks, Nick? Oh yeah. Um, I do. I uh, I mean, I tell you what, I'm listening to right now. Uh, the the premier short story writer in our country right now is named George Saunders. Mm. He's amazing. I he, like George Santos. He's got uh, really yeah, great stories. He also is great at fiction. Creative. Um, <laughs> George, uh, he, and he, he won uh, the Man Booker Prize for his one novel uh, called Lincoln and the Bardo. But here's the wreck. Um, go onto your channels and listen to, listen to him read his own stuff. For being the preeminent, like, the, the scholarly, you know, short story writer who studied under Tobias Wolf at Syracuse, mm. oh, wow. and now he teaches at Syracuse. He sounds he sounds like the most down to earth, like Chicago guy. Yeah. And if you listen to him read his stuff, and my rec to to give you an appetizer, uh, speaking of guac, is <laughs> a story of his called Fox Eight. Okay. It's a short story. Um, if you can read along, because there's some tricks to the way it's written that are visual but you hear him read his stuff and he's just so funny and brilliant and most of all i learn empathy from him uh he also has this great commencement speech that came out as a as a little book mm. called congratulations by the way okay. and so these are these are short takes but i'm telling you He's so funny, it, but uh, but it's also medicinal. So All right. this graduation speech is, is basically just about kindness, mm -hmm. which, again, like my soil material, it doesn't sound like super sexy and funny, but he's he's just a hero to me. Uh, the way that he, um, in the same way that Mike Schur uh, exudes kindness with his television comedy yeah uh george does it with his fiction but it's not corny kindness either it's like it's like it feels it's real sincere it's, 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 i think it's, some it's, shows do the they they kind of beat you over the head with it where oh, it yeah, just doesn't even totally. feel real didn't he write the thing about the two test subjects who were having sex yes yeah what's the, that called again it was uh, so good well um is it is it the one that uh, Hemsworth made into a movie? I didn't see the movie, but I, I yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's called like uh, pull it up. Uh, Saunders yeah. sex test subjects Hemsworth. having sex. Yeah, put, escape or something. It was escape put, from something. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so good. It's so funny and weird and like his, and his um his big uh, number one no, no. Spiderhead. Spiderhead. Spider it's really good. Um. So he get blown by eight women. Yeah, it's so his, his stuff is, is is kind of futuristic, but but really banal and funny. So, for example, in the future, where there are like theme parks, like we have Colonial Williamsburg, there will be future things where people are like live. Things are so shitty that some people live in the theme park, and they wow. their job and their life is they live as like a cave dweller oh interesting and so it's like normal banal language of like okay day 721 the you know the the green food paste is blah 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 and like you fall you fall in love with your co-worker uh -huh. so he, t he takes the banality of daily life and then just gives it the most incredible stakes of of, of love and loss and it it's it, and hearing him read his own stuff even though he he has this like really every man voice is just gorgeous. Uh, I'm listening. I'm re-listening right now to his book, uh, the 10th of December, mm. which is like, there's a, one of the best stories in it, uh, called the, the something diaries, simple four diaries or something like that. Um, it's cool in the future to order Asian girls and you string them up in your yard and mm. they, and they do it with like, 
uh, uh, glass fibers that that feed them and sustain what? their their life, and it's a it's a it's a status thing. So the more girls you have on your clothesline, and so it's just people trying to deal with like we do shit that weird as a society right. where it's like. I the, I have large hoops in my earlobes, or it's just extrapolating sure. to the nth degree. So it's people trying to deal with the <laughs> the reality of like, are they okay? Like, yeah. are, like is this is this is this not s- fucked up? And the 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 um the sophisticates are are like, what are you talking about? Like, we are leaders in this community. We have th- seventeen girls. Yeah, in our yard. Interesting. It's really funny. No, he's really. I've read some of his stuff, and he's amazing. I, I'm definitely going to check this out. And and there was another book you sent, uh, the Walter Berry thing. I saw you talk about it in the oh, news Wendell this morning. Berry. A Wendell Berry. I, I just ordered it because I'm I'm curious now. But uh, yeah, no, I love George Saunders. What I've read, so I'm I'm going to check out this book. Wendell Berry uh, is. Uh, I had lunch with him yesterday in Kentucky. He, he oh, wow. is my hero, who I also have befriended. He and his wife Tanya, and they have a farming program. And if you want to know what's going on with our country uh, and uh, where our food comes from, and mm. and how we should be paying attention to our farmers, agreed. Uh, start with his book, uh, "The Unsettling of America," which. You can hear an audio version in a voice that sounds a lot like this one right here. Um, and then also uh, sort of dovetailed with him is Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma. Oh. It's that uh, these books are incredible where y- you'll never be able to go to the grocery store the same again. Where you'll, Yeah. And, and all it comes down to is beginning to understand which food is good for you Mm -hmm. and which isn't, which is being made for a profit rather than for nutritional value. Uh, We need that stuff because I went to Europe for a month. I I can't eat bread here. I feel horrible. I eat bread over there. I was fine. It's incredible. I mean, just because because they didn't let industrial consumerism take over yes some of their food systems they do so, like their capitalists desperately want to become american like you know oh, really? there are factions because of the money but in grocery stores yeah, yeah because you get rich and they're like fuck nutrition like fuck yeah. your family yes I'm, I'm making money i know it's terrifying i've been drinking tap water my whole life then you see all this stuff about fluoride and you're like yeah. jesus what are yeah. you doing to the the american people so i yeah i don't I don't have great comedy wrecks, but I have great life hack wrecks. I got a good movie wreck for you guys. Sometimes I'll just watch, I'll, I'll be on the road or on like a flight and I'll just watch like old Siskel and Ebert uh, from the 90s. There's there's something so calming about watching yes. them. Yes. They're the, so good together. Was it Night at the Theater? What do they call it? I don't remember the name of the show, uh, but it's but they're just to together. It. It they're so passionate and great. And one of the movie wrecks that they at threw the, out at the movies. At the movies. At the movies. <laughs> they threw out a movie wreck that I was like, all right, this sounds good. Let me watch it. It's called Red Rock West with Nicolas Cage and Dennis Hopper. Mm. It's so fucking good. It's like a weird, obscure noir from the '90s. Highly recommend. Really loved I'm it. In. I okay, loved it. Okay, good. I'll wreck. Check it out. I, it's really cool. It's Dennis Hopper being a psycho and Nicolas sure. Cage being, you know, Nicolas Cage brooding. With, it's really depressed. cool with probably some gorgeous Utah scenery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's awesome. Is it David Lynchy? A little bit. Uh, it's you know who did it? That guy John Dahl. What else did he do? Last Seduction. Oh, that was a pretty cool yeah, movie. Yeah. And I mean, you know, for for the sake of uh, fair play, let's uh, doff our caps to Laura Flynn Boyle. She's awesome. Oh, in I it. love Flynn Boyle. The, she can do comedy too. Yeah, I mentioned this to Colin Quinn yesterday, and he was like, "I used to know her. She's very cool." Oh yeah. Yeah. She was uh, in Men in Black. Yep. Another bo- a book wreck too. If you if because this is coming out this weekend, so uh, Killers of Flower Moon. Read that before the movie comes out. The book is fucking incredible. So, highly recommend. Oh, is that the Scorsese? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that the movie's fun. coming out this month, but uh, the book is insane. It's like a true crime. Really? It's like a true crime, yeah. a noir, a murder mystery. It's it's incredible. I I, I blew love me it. away. So I'm reading his other book, his newer book now. But uh, David Gran, incredible writer. This and the uh, Napoleon movie. I'm like jerking Dude, off to Dude, I can't wait. Joaquin I'm, Phoenix is Napoleon. It's, I know. I know. It's going to be so cool. I know. I hope I hope that that is presaging me as Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> please, please God. Yes. <laughs> well, we know you have, we know you have uh, to get to what what show are you doing next? Um, great question. Oh, what where am I going next? Uh, I have the rest of the day off. Oh, if good. that's what I mean. 
the, the next two days I'm doing a bunch of like the view and uh, to uh, today show and um, Seth Myers. Nice. I was supposed to do Colbert, but I got uh, bumped when the <laughs> strike ended. They were like, we're going to do way bigger, cooler shit than have <laughs> you on with your paperback. So, right. <laughs> so they shunted me to Seth Myers, oh, who, I, you know, is a real champagne problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, oh, no, I, I got have to do another primetime network show. Well, sure. check out Nick's book. Get we're, the book. We're big fans. And the audio book. He does it. And we have some dates for the comedy tour. Oh, Here's humorous tour. Oh, right on. Oh, the, okay. Oh, the 8th? So we have uh, Los Angeles oh, on the 7th. Um, then we have Windsor, Ontario on October 19th. Then you're up in uh, Prior Lake, Minnesota, which I've never heard of. Just outside the Twin Cities. Oh, I've played that yeah. casino before. It's a, it's a nice casino. I love it. And then yeah. uh, Brooks, California on October 21st. Outside of Sacramento. And then on to Baltimore. That's a great Baltimore, room. Baltimore, legendary room. That's north of Miami. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, it's a good spot. Good room. Guys, drink our Bodega Cat Whiskey, bodegacatwhiskey.com. Thank you so much, Nick, for coming on, man. My pleasure. Thank Thanks you. for having me, gentlemen. Great scotch. All right. All right. Thank you, man. Good app. What an app. Guys, you can see me on tour. I'll be uh, November 4th at the theater at Madison Square Garden. That's a big one. There's still some some tickets available. Also, uh, late October, you can see me in Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, uh, Columbus, Cleveland. And then I will be all over Australia in November. Uh, you can see me in Tampa, Fort Myers, Vegas at the Wynn in December. Uh, Philly in January. I mean, I, I'm going to be everywhere, truly everywhere. So uh, Blue Room in uh, Springfield, Missouri, December 28th through 30th. Buffalo as well, your hometown, Matt, uh, in uh, December. All over, Omaha, Dallas, Dania Beach, uh, Madison, Oklahoma City, Dallas, uh, Irvine, California, Salt Lake City, and that's all leading up to my special, which will be on sale later this month in Boston in March. So see you on the road. Now go to Mark's. Mark Norman. You could see this guy everywhere. Man, he's got to get bigger fun on his website. Let's see, October. Yeah, you got to go to the to the city, though. All right. Zoom in on the city. Zoom in on the city? Yeah, right there. Hershey, Tacoma, Oklahoma City, Mark Norman. You can see him in Dallas, Portland, Maine, Providence, Cleveland. He's going to be in Grand Rapids, Denver. Two shows in Denver. Look at that shit. Grand Junction, Colorado. Yeah. Hartford, Hartford, Connecticut. What's at the bottom? New Ham Concord, New Hampshire, Mobile, oh, yeah. Alabama, and hometown hero, N New Orleans, Louisiana, yeah, Mark Sanger. Norman. She's got a piss, so I started reading yours. Oh, <laughs> all right. I'm ready. What else you got there? Uh, Sacramento, oh, Sacramento, Santa two Rosa. shows, Omaha, Kansas City, Norfolk, Baltimore, Birmingham, Shreveport, Tampa, Jacksonville, Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, Lexington, Kentucky, Charlotte. We don't have to do the whole MarkNormanComedy.com. New dates added. You don't say tour. Come on by. It's going to be a hot one. New hour. Hell yeah. Same here. I'm gearing up for that one. It's samuel.com slash shows. Buy Bodega Cat Whiskey at bodegacatwhiskey.com. Nick Offerman was awesome. Great ep. And Great uh, thanks time. for listening, guys. Hell yeah, Bodega Cat. All right, let's put a little weenie down. Weenie. All right. Sunday's the day for my next bender. A bit of Pivarek, you know the beer juice close. I've had a little too much bourbon. And Norman's talking shit about the and I get down in the same